Good day, everyone. Your Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, you are welcome to the Tana Forum Book Launch. My name is Kenneth Omeje. I'm the moderator of this session. With me in this panel are Dr. Yaki Silias, author of Africa First, published in February 2020 by Jonathan Ball, publishers in South Africa. And the, our discussant is uh, Dr. Mata Mutisi, Senior Program Officer at IDRC. This year, the book launch features a publication that examines the potential impact of climate change, conflict, a change in world order, trade integration, and opportunities presented by technology on the continent's current development pathways. Celia's presence and that sees improvements in economic growth, average income, and poverty reduction. We have exactly one hour for this session. We will start with a three-minute minute video presentation of the book, after which I'll welcome Dr. Silias to take us through the highlights of the book, and then the discussant will give us her frank overview of the study. That will be followed by a Q&A. You can text your questions using the messaging tab on the right-hand side of uh, the application. We will try to accommodate as many questions as possible. I now have the pleasure to welcome the technical team for the short video presentation. Technical team, please. Can South Africa ride Africa's development wave? Between now and 2040, almost every second person born is projected to be African, and the continent will account for more than 60% of growth in the world's working age population. Africa is a continent with boundless potential. Why then has the income gap between Africa and the rest of the world been growing since the 1960s? The continent has seen some improvements in infant mortality and life expectancy. But Africa still suffers from massive poverty, inequality, weak economic growth, deindustrialization, an underdeveloped agricultural sector, and limited technology. Things in Africa are improving, but much more slowly than in the rest of the world. One important reason is that slow growth in a locomotive state like South Africa is holding Africa back. South Africa is growing slower than much of Africa and upper middle income countries globally. Is it possible for the continent to start catching up with the rest of the world and for South Africa to serve as a growth engine in the region? Two recent publications from the Institute for Security Studies explore Africa's likely development pathway and long-term future of South Africa. Africa First Igniting a Growth Revolution examines where the continent is and where it will be in 2040 on its current development trajectory. We model 11 transitions from demographics, the implementation to the African continental free trade area, to leapfrogging that could help turn Africa's fortunes around. South Africa First, getting to Tumamena as an aspirational vision for South Africa, focused on spurring long-term growth through transformation in health and education, a resolution to the electricity crisis that enables modern industrialization, and the implementation of land reform that unlocks additional agricultural potential. The growing gap between Africa and the rest of the world is not cast in stone, nor is the pessimism in South Africa's destiny evidence-based learning and determined implementation can significantly transform South Africa and the continent. Thank you very much. Brilliant presentation. Thank you, technical team. May I now welcome the author of Africa First, Dr. Celias, to give us, to take us through uh, the core arguments and policy highlights of the book. Uh, Dr. Celias, you have the floor. 
Thank you very much, Kenneth. I just want to make sure that everybody can, uh, Kenneth, that you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. And um, uh, if um, uh, I'm just waiting for Ben to uh, show the uh, show the the presentation, uh, it was up momentarily. But it's basically I was I was uh, fortunate enough to get a very nice endorsement both from President Ramaphosa as well as uh, President Zebde from the uh, Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. Um, and it basically looks at the long term future of the of the continent. Uh, next slide. So um, the origins of Africa has it in this single graph, which shows at the bottom the GDP per capita of Africa out till 2040, and the blue line on the top, the average GDP per capita in the rest of the world. Uh, can you click three times, please, Ben? Um, the, uh, the challenge that we face is that um, GDP per capita in Africa was 46% of the average in the rest of the world in 1980. At the moment, it's about 26%. And by 2040 on our current path forecast, it should be about 25%. And this growing gap, this uh, is really what Africa First is about. Ben, can you click twice? So this gap continues to expand despite the fact that we expect Africa to grow by about 4.4% average till 2040, from 2020 till 2040, uh, while the average growth rate in the rest of the world is about 2.2%. Next slide. This really is the, uh, the basis of the book. And um, it's very important to understand the impact that COVID has had on the continent. So what this slide presents on the left-hand side is growth rate, and then the green line is Africa's growth rate with the uh, collapse in 2020, according to the IMF, a rebound, um, and then um, growth out till 2040. The dashed black line is the growth forecast before COVID hit. So whereas Africa was expected to grow at about 4.8% before COVID hit, we now expect average growth rate of about 4.1%. Next slide. So what Africa first tries to do is it presents firstly, uh, please click four, five times. It first presents uh, the history and the current path forecast for Africa. It then models 11 scenarios to explore the impact of each goal towards sustainable and sustainable improvements in livelihoods. I model the impact of the various scenarios on climate change and jobs. And then I look at the combined impact of uh, Africa first and throughout there are a number of policy recommendations. Next slide. So what Africa first does, it presents on the one side um, Africa's current path, where we expect Africa to go under current circumstances. And then for each of these 11 scenarios that I've mentioned, like demographics, agriculture, improvements in water, sanitation, and so on and so forth, I measure what is possible by 2040. Next slide. Now, the challenge with Africa is, uh, click uh, four times, please, that Africa is not the, the nature of growth in Africa is different to that in the rest of the world. Generally, countries grow wealthy and prosper uh, through the structural transformation of their economies, moving capital and labor from lower to higher productivity sectors. This is generally known as the manufacturing escalator, because in Africa, manufacturing is about six times more productive uh, than uh, the agricultural sector. And manufacturing has a spillover into the agricultural and services sector. Uh, next, uh, click, uh, click, click, please. But what we see in Africa is that we see a movement from subsistence agriculture to low-end retail services in informal, urban informal areas. And we see the growth in capital-intense resources and energy-based industries that generate few jobs. What's happening, for example, in the northern part of Mozambique, uh, is a classic example of this. And uh, a big scheme that could 
that according to many could unlock growth in the DRC, that the Grand Inga scheme is another example of the focus in Africa often on large infrastructure projects that have actually very little benefit. Next slide. So in the video that you saw, um, I showed you the uh, 11 scenarios that we model in Africa first, um, the interventions that we pull. Next slide. And you would have seen um, this a graphic that shows the 11 sets of interventions ranging from demographics to basic infrastructure, education, agriculture, social grants made in Africa or industrialization, the potential of leapfrogging, the potential impact of the African continental free trade area, which is also the theme for the Tana Forum, silencing the guns, democratization, the impact of uh, better governance, and then the impact of foreign assistance, uh, foreign direct investment, aid, and remittances. Next slide. Of course, these scenarios do not have the same impact. For example, if uh, in, in this slide, what you see on the left-hand side are the 11 scenarios that I model in Africa first, and then I look at what is the best impact on low, lower middle or upper middle income countries. So agriculture has a benefit for low income countries, low middle and uh, uh, for all countries at all levels of development. Second, made in after industrialization, leapfrogging, and the implementation of the African continental free trade or area, according to my analysis, by 2040 um, has the most impact. So those four scenarios, agriculture, made in Africa or industrialization, leapfrogging, and the implementation of the African continental free trade area are the four scenarios that have the most impact by 2040 to improve average incomes in Africa and reduce poverty. Next slide. But the situation changes if you, for example, look out to a longer, a longer time horizon. So this shows the impact of those scenarios by 2050, where you can see that for low income countries, Agriculture, industrialization, and leapfrogging is important, but now the continental free trade area for low middle and upper middle income countries becomes extremely important. Next slide. In this uh, slide, I show you what is the impact of average levels of GDP per capita for Africa from 2018 until 2040. The dashed black line is the pre-COVID average GDP per capita for Africa. Um, the solid green line is the current path or Africa's current forecast. And then the dashed black line is what could be possible with uh, the implementation of all of these 11 scenarios that come together in a made in Africa scenario. Next slide. And this slide now shows you um, the impact on extreme poverty. The top shows percent of population we expect Africa to have a modest decline in reductions in, in uh, extreme poverty in percent of population in the top slide. And the bottom slide is millions of people. Now, Africa is not going to reach SDG goal one, elimination of extreme poverty by 2030 by a long stretch. As you will see in the bottom part of that graph, that in actual fact, average level, average levels of of the number of Africans living in extreme poverty is probably going to increase beyond 2030. And the re main reason is Africa is simply not growing rapidly enough. Next slide. So the argument in Africa first is really about the need to speed up Africa's social, economic, and political transition. Uh, one click. The most important is firstly for Africa to move rapidly up its demographic dividend. Much of Africa is about 30 years away from entering its demographic dividend, largely because the continent has such a young population that it has so many dependents that in actual fact, um, you have to grow at two, two or three times the rate of growth that Africa is expected to grow. We need to roll out improved water and sanitation, invest in education, agriculture, manufacturing, but that will not produce enough jobs. So there is also the need to roll out social grants while using digitization, fourth industrial revolution to leapfrog. Next click. So trade integration will be key, um, i.e. the implementation of the African continental free trade area, as will be efforts to silence the guns and improve governance. But all of this takes a lot of time. 
Aid and remittances remain important, particularly for low-income countries, as um, foreign direct investment largely goes to upper-middle-income countries. Click. So each scenario that I present in Africa first, I also measure what is the impact on carbon emissions and what is the impact on jobs. Next click. And the contribution of each scenario obviously differs from country to country and requires significant more work, but it illustrates the efforts that will be required to put Africa first and unleash a growth revolution. Next slide. So in the final chapter of Africa first, I speak about a standard growth model. Uh, click, please. The first requirement is clear leadership from a ruling elite or government. And this is often absent. It is in actual fact not democracy or authoritarianism that leads to growth, but the quality of the orientation of the ruling, ruling elite. The next requirement is food self-sufficiency and calories. In Africa, we often talk about agriculture, but we actually do very little about it. Next click. Then we have to focus on primary education and literacy. Next one, facilitate the demographic transition and, and the dividend. Next one, Enter low-end manufacturing or agro-processing facilitated by government support. Next one, go into secondary, vocationally, and tertiary education. Next one, export, moving towards an export economy as part of global value chains, which unlocks the private sector. Next one, and go up the manufacturing value uh, curve. And next one, and eventually, growth in Africa will, like it is in much of the rest of the world, be driven by services. Uh, next slide. So um, those are a few remarks about um, Africa First. Um, and thank you very much for the opportunity and the honor by the Tana Forum to um, uh, profile Africa First. I must make one apology, and that is that the video that we showed right at the beginning was a video that combined Africa First with a study we did on South Africa. And uh, it was an actual fact, the wrong video, but never mind. Uh, thank you very much, uh, moderator. Um, and uh, uh, I think we can end the share screen now. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yaki. Uh, thank you for that very stimulating uh, presentation. 11 thought-provoking scenarios of uh, how to unlock growth in Africa over the next two decades are moving forward. Thank you very much. I'm still, I'm, I've been checking the messaging tab. Please use the, use the messaging tab to... Uh, Send in your questions. I haven't seen the questions coming yet. So, so that after uh, we've listened to the discussant, then we can take the questions. Now it's my pleasure to welcome Marta uh, to give us her frank views, overview of the study. Thank you, Marta. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. Uh, and uh, thank you, Yaki, um, uh, for uh, the overview of uh, your book. I must say that uh, it's a very impressive depiction of uh, the African continent in terms of uh, progress that has made uh, that has been made thus far, particularly in terms of infrastructural development, socioeconomic growth, and also some uh, tangible um, uh, transformation in terms of uh, human security. The book cites uh, um, the lowering of uh, mortality rates. Uh, it improvements uh, in uh, dealing with some of the communicable diseases that we have seen in the continent. Uh, but it's also a sobering uh, reflection in terms of the outstanding challenges that the continent uh, still faces today. Uh, the book also notes the, the um, issue of uh, the gap between uh, norm setting and norm implementation, and also the fact that uh, when you look at uh, the projections of uh, growth, Africa um, is uh, expected to uh, be quite behind the rest of the world in terms of uh, the average GDP. Uh, the book uh, says, says that by 2040, Africa would be uh, uh, less than a quarter of the average uh, of the GDP of, uh, of uh, when compared to the rest of the continent, which is quite uh, worrisome in terms of um, uh, where we want to see the continent going vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Agenda 2063, uh, which is the socioeconomic blueprint of the continent that has been uh, laid out. The book also, I think I, I must applaud uh, the author for really looking at um, Africa, not just uh, 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 in, uh, 
currently, but are tracing the historical development of the continent. So I, I really appreciated the focus on some of the challenges that Africa faced before, including the structural uh, adjustment programs, uh, which were implemented uh, in the nine, late 80s, 90s, which are still have uh, uh, quite untold impact on the continent, even as we speak today. So I think that also uh, um, raises other issues that um, uh, I'll, 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 I'll point out in terms of uh, um, some of the issues that could have been given more salience in the book. In the book, I like the the eleven um, the, the the eleven scenarios that uh, uh, Yaki uh, presents in the in the in the book in terms of uh, uh, what it means in terms of pro propelling the growth of the African uh, continent going forward. Um, the only thing that I found, I, I, I thought the 11 interventions are very comprehensive, but I thought uh, the, the book could have been enhanced by um, uh, a gendered analysis, because I think there is enough evidence to, sh to show that the African continent is losing about 95, 95 billion annually because of the gender gap. So I was a bit surprised that out of the interventions that were uh, presented, uh, the book was a little bit silent uh, on gender issues because I think uh, gender equality has been known to actually promote socioeconomic development, political advancement, and even security. So I thought maybe the book could have uh, dealt uh, with that. Uh, another thing that also uh, that I found uh, surprising uh, Perhaps it's also the data. Uh, I mean, you can you cannot argue with the data. Is the book stands on the demographic di dividend? Because I think the song that has been sung <laughs> um, for the longest time is that Africa's uh, youth is a is, is a dividend. It's it's, it's not a threat. And um, even the global study on uh, youth peace and security, the one done by your fellow compatriot, uh, uh, Graham Simpson, seems to uh, think otherwise that Africa's uh, demographic, uh, Africa's youthful population is actually its saving, it's, 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 it's actually its advantage. But uh, you seem to be more pessimistic uh, because um, you mentioned that uh, more uh, a more youthful population means that uh, there are people who are, are likely to be wanting resources from the continent, wanting to get employed and things like that. But on the other hand, I thought that a, a demographic, um, a, youth pop, a youthful population is um, an arena for energy, innovation, uh, uh, as well as, um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, people who can actually expand uh, their expertise to help uh, uh, propel the growth of the African continent going forward. So, yeah, that's one of uh, the areas where I found, uh, where I, 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 I wanted to challenge you as an author, but um, um, maybe your, your data uh, says otherwise. I also wanted to say, uh, I, I like in your presentation, you also mentioned the, the pre-COVID uh, uh, expected growth rate, and, and now we are in the era of COVID. I was wondering whether the, I, I know that the book was published way before the, uh, the pandemic, but um, I was wondering whether uh, the fact that Africa has been, uh, a bit um, in terms of when we are compa comparing the continent to other continents in terms of uh, experiencing the pandemic, there is emerging evidence that the African continent is done fairly well uh, compared to other continents, compared to whether it's North America, whether it's uh, Asia, whether it's the Middle East. So does that put Africa at an advantage uh, given that the, the African continent has dealt with the COVID pandemic fairly well, uh, relatively well compared to other continents. Does that make Africa regain uh, some of its uh, lost traction, for example? Um, I think uh, maybe in terms of the 11 interventions, uh, it would be important. Uh, what COVID has reminded us is that there is a need to also think about socioeconomic growth vis-a-vis -vis public health security, because it's one of the areas that we hardly thought about before COVID, how everything uh, sometimes can actually be dependent uh, on how healthy um, uh, 
communities are uh, or nations are or even uh, the whole globe uh, is. So in terms of some of the recommendations that you raise, uh, I like the fact that you say that there's need for more investment in infrastructure, there's need for accountability, there's need for democ democracy and governance. But I think there's also need for us to start thinking more seriously about investing in public health security from a prevention perspective, but also from a response perspective to an awareness and, and also to grow uh, public health funding as a strategy of um, actually dealing with uh, uh, growth in the African continent. I was also hoping uh, to see in the book, uh, uh, to see you dwell more on the impact of elections uh, in the types of elections that we are seeing in the African continent. I know that you you, you, you put governance and democracy as one of the uh, 11 critical interventions uh, in Africa that will determine the, the, the path of the continent going forward. But I wanted uh, you to deconstruct the nature of the democracy that we're talking about, because there has been criticism on this issue of uh, what Paul Collier calls democracy. Democracy is the obsession with uh, elections uh, well, mostly timed every four years or every five years without necessarily changing how institutions operate democratically. Is there a way Africa can chart its own way forward without necessarily being beholden to the five-year, four-year timelines for doing elections and ticking the box when we know that the elections are not going to be credible, they are going to be contested and things like that. So I was hoping that uh, Africa first would actually begin to interrogate some of the issues uh, related to the elections. And um, um, I, I was also thinking that uh, maybe as an author, you could also bring some of the unique unique advantages of the African continent that could that we can tap into. Uh, if we look at the growth of the Asian tigers, if we look at the growth of China, if we look at the growth of Japan, I think their culture really played a very important role. The role of Confucianism, for example, um, played a very important role in the, in, in, in the growth of uh, uh, some Asian countries. So now that we have uh, the, uh, mechanisms like the panel of the wise, what could be the role of our reverence to African wisdom, to um, uh, African um, uh, expertise? How can we use that wisdom to propel the growth of the African continent? So I wanted us, uh, I wanted the, 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 the book to go deeper in terms of how we can use um, uh, attributes that are sui generis Af African to ensure that we develop the continent further. And also, I, I thought, uh, I, I, I know you, have, oh, you, you critique structural adjustment programs, but we still have the new scramble for Africa that is also taking place. So I was hoping that you could also uh, critique the continuation of uh, neo-colonialism, neo, neo um, the continuation of dominance uh, by Western powers, and also the geopolitics and how it is actually impacting on the ability for Africa to promote its growth. Sometimes even the, the, the whole con concept of intra-African trade, it's actually uh, curtailed by the divisions that are uh, brought into the continent. So how can African leaders, how can we do, uh, how, how can Africans do better in terms of dealing with the unequal or the, the lack of equidistance when it comes to uh, global geopolitics. Because yes, in as much as we can, we can provide interventions for what Africa can do, it is also important to uh, 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 name what some of the challenges uh, that are coming from uh, external to the continent and how can we actually do better in terms of uh, confronting the, those challenges. But I really liked uh, the book. Uh, it's, a, it's a refreshing breath, uh, breath of air. Uh, it's, uh, it tells the truth as it, uh, as it is. It also uh, does not mean words in terms of where we are remaining in terms of the outstanding challenges, but it also uh, uh, highlights some of the achievements in and, uh, how we can build on those achievements. Um, perhaps lastly, um, my, you raised the point of uh, grandiose uh, infrastructural development projects that do not have impact. Um, 
I know that uh, currently uh, in DRC, there's the Grand Inga, Inga, Inga Dam project that is uh, already taking place. And also in Ethiopia, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Uh, some, some studies would, would beg to differ. Uh, for example, uh, the GERD in Ethiopia is anticipated to power um, quite a lot of uh, uh, countries in terms of uh, providing energy to a number of uh, African countries and thereby providing uh, the, the much needed energy that we would need to prepare uh, growth for the African country. So maybe what you, you, the book could have done is to uh, critique how can we make huge infrastructural projects work to Africa's advantages? How can we make uh, such projects uh, uh, succeed? Because on their own, I think infrastructure development on its own is not a negative thing, but it's, it's when it's not accounted for, it's when it's accompanied by too much debt that it becomes challenging. But when it's really uh, uh, set within the confines of proper financial management, proper governance, accountability to citizens, I think there's nothing wrong with infrastructure uh, development for the continent. Thank you so much. A number of questions, and I'll just pose a few, a few of them. I don't expect that that the author has to respond to all of the issues that she has raised. But let me just present or pose about four of them, two at a time, and then uh, Yaki can respond. Number one, uh, the book could have been enhanced by a gender analysis. The book is silent on the issue of gender. You want to address that, and then secondly. Uh, the African uh, youthful population is an advantage, uh, what is popularly known as uh, the demographic dividend. Are you as optimistic as matter? Uh, Yaki, your thoughts? Is Yaki there? Hello? Uh, Munib, are you there? The technical team, have we lost Yaki? No, I'm here. <laughs> okay, please. Uh, Yaki, I've posed two questions. From... Yes, no, I've, I've heard them. I've you heard them. them, please. Yeah, okay. no, thanks very much. Now, there's, a, there's some, I think, technical problems with the platform that uh, obviously... So, uh, first, on the... Um, on the gender issue, there's actually quite a lot uh, in the book on gender. There's an entire chapter, uh, the chapter on education, where we, in actual fact, uh, model uh, the, Im the impact of um, uh, achieving Africa, uh, um, achieving equity between uh, girls and boys and men and women on the entire educational um, forecast and the impact that that has on, on uh, improved livelihoods, as well as in the, in the demographics chapter. So there is, uh, I defend myself on the gender stuff, there's quite a bit on the book there. The demographic dividend issue is... Um, uh, there are a number of Afri the, the argument uh, countries get to their demographic dividend when the ratio of working age people to dependents gets to 1.7 and above. When there is 1.7, almost two working age people aged 15 to 64 relative to children below 15 and elderly above 64. There are a number of countries like Egypt, South Africa, uh, Tunisia that are in their demographic dividend, but the vast majority of African countries, most of them low and lower middle income countries, only enter that sweet spot in about 2054. So the argument in the book is that Africa's very youthful population in much of sub-Saharan Africa, it, it is uh, a, a drag on growth and will remain a declining drag on growth for the next 30 years. This is Contrary to what most people believe, people tend to argue that Africa's got a young population, the future belongs to us. The problem is that we have such a young population that you cannot build schools fast enough. You cannot provide teachers. You cannot roll out water, sanitation and jobs fast enough. 
So countries, and you can see this when you look at South Korea, the Asian tigers and all of these countries, um, the, if once you get to your demographic dividend, um, labor starts making a much larger contribution to growth. Remember, there are three components of growth, labor, capital, and technology. For Africa, our most important contribution is from labor because we have a large population, a growing population. But that population is so young that uh, we cannot continue to, to service them. So that's just the, the argument on, on the demographic dividend. We have to get on top of the demographic dividend. We've done a number of country studies in Ethiopia, Angola, Mozambique, um, uh, Kenya, uh, and these are com countries and the Sahel countries. These are countries that if they do not get on top of their demographics, uh, they will almost never be able to grow ra sufficiently rapidly to be able to provide sufficient jobs. Um, there are many other issues that I can that I can respond to. Maybe I'll just respond to the 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 grand, the, um, the big infrastructure issue. Um, and we've done a study, we're just finishing up a study on the DRC and we uh, uh, done quite a lot of work on Ethiopia. Now, Ethiopia is one of the few African countries where um, investments in large scale infrastructure have to a degree paid off. But I doubt if that will be the case in the DRC or in Northern Mozambique, because what Ethiopia is doing, it's integrating its infrastructure into its economy. But what is, uh, but what is very often happening is that we, undertake large standalone infrastructure projects that are not integrated into national and regional value chains. So um, on the issue of infrastructure, it depends. Um, on uh, If you're the Ethiopians, which have an effective government, effective governance, and have a clear vision of where they want to go, yes, large-scale infrastructure pays and pays off. Railway lines to Djibouti, uh, grand, uh, the um, uh, Grand Renaissance Dam and so on and so forth. But uh, in our study of Ethiopia, we clearly see that if Ethiopia does not focus on um, lower secondary education and the provision of water and sanitation to its large growing population, it will not be able to go up the manufacturing uh, value chain because it's held back by the absence of investment in, in its human capital. I'll stop there. There are many things I can say uh, in response, but I'll, I'll first stop there. Th th thank, thanks again, Iaki. Thanks, thank you for those uh, expositions. Further on from uh, Mata's um, brilliant discussion, two more questions. The role of uh, Africa's worldview in repositioning the continent for growth in a similar way that uh, Confucianism, for instance, did for the Asian Tigers. And then secondly, the challenges posed by international political economy um, to Africa's growth possibilities. Any thoughts on that? Yaki again. Hey. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Ah, my apologies. Let's start with the issue of um, Confucianism and growth and so on and so forth. Um, many of Africa's problems go back to the era of colonialism because what we have in much of Africa is we have an imposed state. We don't have African um, states that cohere with the ancient empires and kingdoms of the continent. So you had a bunch of foreigners which came and drew lines on a map, and that was uh, the continent. Now, I, I tend to believe that nationalism precedes development. I'll say that again. Nationalism precedes development. When countries are established uh, and have a coherent sense of being a country, they very often can more rapidly move forward. But what we have in Africa is we have imposed statehood. And the second thing um, is that we are, we are not, whereas in the rest of the world, democracy followed upon development. What we have in Africa is we are democratizing and we are trying to develop at the same time. And that is, that's never happened anywhere in the world. Whether you look at the Asian tigers, whether you look at Europe, you've generally had a situation where development growth preceded democratization. We're trying to do these two things at the same time. And this takes me to the problem that we have with regard to the quality of democracy and of governance. And, uh, and, the, um, and we, we've talked a little bit about that. What we have in our Africa very often is we have electoral democracy. 
We go through the motions of, ele- of regular elections, but it does not translate into substantive democracy where people are actually held to account. So every five years we go to elections. We elect a new bunch of people, people that uh, are no better than the previous uh, bunch who, who ruled, but they are not held accountable. So it is largely because our elections are uh, not f- really free and fair, because very often what happens is the incumbent uh, manages the situation to make sure that he or she wins. Um, and this goes, um, I see in the, in, the, in the question session also about um, the African peer review and the pan-African parliament. Now, <laughs> I, I, I think the African peer review mechanism is very important because it plays, uh, it, it should help to move the African governance architecture forward. But I think the pan-African parliament is completely a waste of time. I think it serves absolutely no purpose. There is no sense of movement of African leaders that are going to provide a degree of devolution of authority to the Pan-African Parliament. It's an entire waste of money and time. And I think we are ahead, we are probably 20, 30 years ahead of our time with the Pan-African Parliament. But the technical instruments of building substantive democracy in Africa, not electoral democracy, not going through the motions, very important for the continent. Because as I'm saying, we are trying to democratize and grow at the same time. And this is, uh, that can only happen if there's really uh, real accountability in terms of the regular elections that are being held on the continent. Okay. Th- thank you. Thank you, Yaki. This is a question from uh, Kabela Matlosa. It will be interesting to hear the author's take on the impact of illicit financial outflows from Africa to other parts of the world. This is part of corruption. How do illicit financial flows and corruption impact on growth and development? Your thoughts, please. Thanks. It's one of the areas that um, I did not address in the book, and I must be, be um, it's, a, it's a bit of a, we, we are now busy with an entire updating and revision of the forecast that we've done in Africa first, and we are going to uh, include that. Um, but I want to make two comments on that. Um, Africa is not more corrupt than any other continent. Uh, that's a complete misunderstanding. Corruption happens where there's the most money, and the most money is certainly not in Africa. But the difference, and we all know this, is that um, many are that people externalize the corruption in Africa. So people steal money, and they then go and invest it in the US or the Virgin Islands or the UK or Switzerland. Whereas the corruption that happened in the Asian Tigers and uh, and so on, the money stayed within the system. And it greased the wheels of development. Um, and I think that that's um, so um, it's, it's a broad point about the nature of, of corruption on the continent. On the issue of illicit financial flows, I think that Africa is affected by that as much as anybody else. But I think that there, a lot of work needs to be done to see to what extent the data that we're getting is really real. Um, I, I think that there's really problems with the data because, um, as you would know, uh, money goes through shell companies and through offshore for tax purposes. That makes it very difficult to account for that. And we've had a number of workshops where we try to get to the bottom of exactly what are the true amounts. Never mind what we should be doing is we should be, ma- we should be simplifying tax uh, regimes in Africa which uh, doing away with all the loopholes, getting to uh, lower, but simple tariff uh, systems and holding companies and, uh, and foreigners to account that they pay their tax. And that will do more for also reducing uh, these outflows, closing all the loopholes, making, it, making tax in Africa simple and predictable. Um, then, and it will also, to a degree, deal with some of the um, illicit outflows. But I think a bit more work needs to be done on some of the figures that I've seen um, with regard to illicit outflows. I'm not entirely convinced that we're on top of that situation. Oh, oh very interesting views. Uh, t- t- thank you again. This is a, a question from uh, this is a question from Yadel. And the question says, uh, how does this book anticipate conflict and natural disaster to affect uh, growth in Africa? Thanks. So there's an entire chapter where I look at the na- how conflict is changing on the, on the continent and expected future trends. 
Now, contrary to what most people think, Africa today is much more stable than it was, let's say, at the end of the Cold War. But the nature of that conflict has changed. Um, so um, uh, what we see broadly, and I, I know that there are huge exceptions to this, first is that conflict is restricted to a number of, of, of countries, seven or, I think seven or 11. Um, and of course, particularly in North Africa and the Sahel, uh, the uh, events in Libya and uh, what has happened after that has had a huge impact on the continent. But generally armed violence, so what I do is I measure um, instability on a per capita basis. Because Africa has a very large growing population, it is to be expected that the, the amount of e incidents will increase over time. But if you look at it on a per capita basis, you can see if on a general basis, if the continent is more stable or unstable. And the broad trend is that Africa is becoming more stable with every passing year. When you speak of armed conflict, armed violence on a per capita basis, it's of course not the impression you get when you look at the media. But on the one hand, while armed conflict is coming down, social turbulence um, is increasing. Uh, largely riots and um, violence in towns and cities. And that is partly a function of Africa's relatively rapid democratization process. If you measure levels of democracy in Africa, Africa is in actual fact more democratic than you would expect. And the space that we are providing for democracy and for government protest means that in many of our urban areas, we are experiencing problems. And COVID is going to exacerbate that because what COVID is doing is COVID is reducing lots of things. The impact of COVID in 2020, we released a big report on this a few weeks ago. The impact on COVID in Africa is that this year alone, the African economy, which is about $3 trillion, will be about $240 billion smaller. The impact is massive, and we are going to live with the impact of COVID for many years to come. But part of that impact is that African governments have less money to spend on security, on the provision of water, sanitation, and all other things. And that means that we that the, the short-term prognosis, by short-term I mean the next two, three, four, five years, is probably going to be an increase in violence and instability on the continent because of the impact of COVID. Um, so I, I, we, we have to run even much harder if we are going to move forward uh, and regain uh, the um, uh, income uh, reduced uh, and, and the uh, reductions, the increases in poverty that we've seen um, uh, in, the, in the years that come. Thanks, thank you, Yaki. I want to pose a personal question now. Um, and then after that, I'll use the, the next 10 minutes to welcome two or three participants to give uh, direct comments or make or pr present their questions directly. Uh, I will be welcoming Professor Laid Zaglami in case he's connected. Of course, he's connected. So uh, you'll be posing your question after the next response from uh, the author. And then also E.K. Bensa, E.K. Bensa Jr. E.K. Bensa Jr. Could both of you be ready? Now, uh, Yaki, how can we get African policymakers, both at the national level and uh, the level of uh, our regional institutions, to read this book and to give serious considerations to the policy proposals and recommendations that you have put forward, which can help to uh, power growth and development in the continent? Well, let me say the invitation by, by the Tana Forum and others to um, uh, launch the book is, is very welcome. But we are busy with a massive follow-on project. Um, uh, Kenneth, you mentioned that Africa First came out in February of this year. Uh, therefore, um, it preceded the entire um, COVID uh, impact. But we have brought out a number of reports on COVID. But at the moment, we are busy with a large follow-on project ca called Potential to Prosperity, which really is taking every of the 11 scenarios in Africa First um, and um, modeling them down to individual country level. Uh, we are this week having, for example, a session tomorrow with global experts on agriculture and on Thursday a meeting of global experts on education. And with each of these, we are refining our forecasts and we will be releasing this um, uh, during with a series of papers next year. And I'm hoping that that will create the momentum 
um, uh, to popularize and to make it um, much more easily digestible uh, instead of wading through the 11 scenarios that are in, uh, that are in Africa first. So we, 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 we're trying our best to, to make the book uh, as widely available as possible. There's a video and extracts from the book available on my website. Uh, my name is, my web, is the website. It's just easier to go there uh, than, than anywhere else. Okay. Thank you. Now I welcome um, Professor Laid Zaglami. You have the floor, Laid. Professor Zaglami, are you there? He's not there. Professor Zaglami. I think the question is very clear in the chat function. Um, maybe okay. one can just, just read it from there. Uh, and uh, he says, let's to move to something uh, that may be per pertinent or may not be, uh, that he, uh, which is the world's debt to Africa, what the world owes to Africa in terms of reparations and memories in order to enable the continent playing a key role in world affairs. Yeah. And of course, that's, that's a, a big, big issue. But the world, I'm, I'm sorry to say, doesn't care. Um, we have to take ownership of our own development. And once we have turned Africa around and we are a global player, will we be able to speak about these things? I mean, in my book, I go back sometimes uh, very far into history to try and show the impact that, um, for example, geography and climate has had on uh, the disease burden in Africa. The impact that slavery has had on the lack of um, agriculture, domestic agriculture um, in Africa, because Africa embarked on a, because of our history, on a very different development trajectory compared to the rest of the world, largely because of external intervention. And those interventions are well documented, but I don't think that uh, the rest of the, whether it is China, whether it is India, whether it is the US or whatever, um, the, the you know power talks and once africa is no longer 4% of the global economy we are less than 4% of the global economy once we are 10 12 13 14% then the world will stay to take us seriously for for that we need to fix things the basic things in africa and those basic things are making sure our people have electricity um, and you can get that through leapfrogging, making sure our people are connected to the world and that they have water and sanitation and so on and so forth. And once you get that, then, um, and we are a player globally, then we can start talking about these things. But I'm afraid um, uh, the rest of the world, um, yeah, I don't think take these things seriously. We, and it doesn't help for us to talk about this unless we get our own uh, house in order. But that's my view. I think I completely agree with you on that. It is our responsibility to transform this continent and to be on the driving seat to do that. Then the rest of the world probably can can give 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 their support. Okay, I can see uh, Ik Bensa. You have the floor. Ik Bensa. All right. Thank yes. you. Yes. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Um, so thank you for the opportunity. Um, and thank you for the review by uh, Dr. Mutisi. Great, uh, uh, fantastic idea, concept for the book. Um, two questions. First of all, we're talking about Africa first. Um, I'd like to think that an Africa first includes the recognition of the role of people's voices as prescribed by parliaments, the regional parliaments, East Africa Legislative Assembly, ECOWAS Parliament, our local parliaments and so on. And yes, so whilst there may be some level of consensus around the Pan-African Parliament being a waste of time, is it also not the case that it has not really been empowered? Because imagine a, a Pan-African Parliament that has been empowered to become more of a legislative body as we have with the East Africa case, where the decisions taken on East African countries are binding on the six member states. Uh, ECOWAS is also working on something like that. Um, but you don't have that with the Pan-African Parliament. It's been around since 2004. And member states are hesitant because they don't want that level of scrutiny on their country. So really, it is a, a more a case of not being empowered um, because of whatever fears uh, you know, member states will have, reason for which we have uh, you know, uh, 
a paper tiger mm -hmm. in, 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 in the Pan-African Parliament. The second question is on, what, what are your thoughts, Mr. Silia, is on now? on AU reforms, because AU reforms uh, is, is upon us, implementation in 2021. A lot of things are going to take place. The, there's going to be Department of Political Affairs is going to collapse into uh, something, a different organism, it will become the yeah. you know, Political Affairs, Peace and Security, which will therefore offer a, a different conversation on how peace and security will be, will be prosecuted across the world, because now it's being linked with governance and what that portend for, for for the continent. And then there are the other things on the Freedom of Movement Protocol, the AU levy, which will offer significant revenue for the uh, African uh, countries. Right now, about eight to 10 countries are only paying the, the levy, countries including Rwanda, Kenya, Ghana, Chad. There's not enough countries. We need more countries to be paying 0.2% of the levy to be able to wean themselves donor driven uh, mindset that has, that has dominated the for such a long time. So what are your thoughts on some of these questions? Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks very much. Great questions. Uh, Kenneth, can I respond? Yes, please. You're welcome. You have the floor. Uh, so I'm, um, uh, I'm a great fan of the Africa Union. I used to work with the OAU for probably more than a decade. But remember that what is happening with a with the structural reform that you're referring to with the African Union is that we're going back to the OAU structure where political affairs and peace and security were, were one department. Um, the problem is that uh, member states at that time, uh, it has changed um, to a degree. But the, the main obstacle within the African Union on governance issues is member states who are not prepared to um, allow free and fair elections uh, in quite a number of countries. Uh, and I go back to a previous comment that was made, that what we have in Africa is we have electoral democracy. We go through the motions of elections, but the elections are not substantively free and fair. Only if you have substantive free and fair elections that hold national governments to account, does democracy really make a difference? Um, and um, uh, that also speaks to the issue of the regional parliaments and the Pan-African Parliament. I think we have to fix democracy first at the national level. And then the next step at the continental level is the implementation of the African continental free trade area. The implementation of the free trade area can make a substantive difference to the future of the continent. It's not imagined. Um, I, I've modeled it. I've had a look at it. We all know this. Let's move forward on the practical steps in my view. Um, and then let's relook the um, uh, devolution of authority and responsibility to the Pan-African Parliament and other uh, uh, structures at a later point. In any case, uh, when we look at tariff reductions and elimination within the African continental free trade area, that's going to be a real litmus test. Are African leaders really prepared to implement the continental free trade area when they stand and they look at the potential tariff loss that they're going to suffer in the short term? We've seen large countries in, in Africa, Nigeria would be an example, the, the internal debate that happened um, before they acceded uh, to the continental free trade area. So I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant about uh, creating more supranational structures, political structures like Pan-African Parliament regional assemblies um, without um, first getting some of the basics like uh, uh, tariff reductions and, and so on sorted out. Because those practical issues that I'm referring to, getting managing to get rid of non-tariff barriers uh, are, are doable and they can make a substantive difference to the continent. And I think that that's, in my view, where the, where the progress uh, uh, should be. Um, so, yeah. Uh, it's 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 about the nature of democracy that 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 really I, I think we're talking about. Uh, okay, I'm mindful of time. We have just about two minutes to finish. Uh, there are many more questions, but we can't accommodate them. So my apologies to all others that we are not able to take their questions. Uh, Yaku, one final uh, question: How can we? assess this book for those of us that are for people connected or listening to you that would want to read the book. How can they get the book? How much does it cost? And from here, can they get it? It's, a, it's available on Amazon. Um, but if you can't get the book, send me a mail. 
um, uh, go to my uh, my my website um, yakisalia.org and there's a place where you can contact me and I will make sure that somehow we find a way to get it to you it's on Amazon it's not expensive by the way it's uh, it's, it's very it's very uh, it's, it's quite I think it's it was five or six dollars at one point it wasn't expensive um, but we are rolling it out and otherwise contact anybody at the institute at the Institute for security studies okay Thank you to all the participants. I want to take this uh, closing opportunity to thank the author, uh, Yaki, and our discussant, Mata, and all the session participants for their frank and stimulating perspectives. Uh, you would agree with me that Africa First is a remarkable and timely piece of uh, academic and policy research on Africa's development and challenges and the pathway forward. One hour is certainly not enough to discuss a book of uh, 379 pages on a topical issue as Africa's development. I would therefore earnestly recommend that everybody gets a copy of this book. Uh, social science lecturers and researchers in our midst, especially from fields like economics, political science, sociology, peace, conflict, and governments, governance studies, etc. You are all encouraged to recommend that and adopt this book as a major text for some of your undergraduate and uh, postgraduate degree courses. And you've heard from uh, uh, Yaki how you can get the book. You can order it, hard copy. You can also access the Kindle edition um, from various online bookstores. You can write to Yaki directly. You can place an order perhaps through your university bookshop. And we've also heard from him that the book is quite affordable. So on this note, could you all join me to say a big congratulations to Yaki for his new book, uh, uh, well, a well-researched book. And thanks to every one of you for your engaging participation. Thank you very much. That brings this session to an end. Thank you, Yaki, and thank you, Mata. Thanks very much, Kenneth and Martha. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Professor Kenneth Omeje, thank you, Yaki Silias and Dr. Martha Mtisi for an engaging uh, first discussion at this year's Tana Forum. We're going to take a short break, uh, and we'll be back in exactly eight minutes for the Melazanawi uh, Memorial. Uh, lecture. So all the best to everybody joining us online and Yaki has indicated where you can get a copy of the book. Yaki, all the best. Martha, great having you and Kenneth on the panel. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. It is um, 3 p.m. and uh, I have the honor and privilege in the tradition of Tana of welcoming your excellencies, uh, distinguished participants, uh, comrades and friends to the Mela Zanawi Memorial Lecture. Our moderator, is no less or no other than Ms. Hannah Tzadik, who's the director of the Global Policy Life and Peace Institute, uh, a well-established Pan-Africanist, and also uh, an authority on matters of leadership. She will introduce our speaker uh, this uh, afternoon, who is no stranger uh, to you. Uh, Hannah, welcome. Uh, Thank you, Brian. Can you hear me well? I'm hoping you can hear me. Um, good afternoon. Bon après-midi, distinguished delegates. Uh, as we say in Amharic. It's a pleasure, truly, to be here with all of you virtually to kick off the first main day of the ninth Tana Forum. We've already had an excellent start with the book launch, and I'm really excited to now move us into the annual Melazenawi Lecture. 
I'm joining you today from Nairobi, Kenya. It's a bit gray here, but I hope it's sunny wherever you are. Um, I've been a part of the Tana family since 2014, when I first attended the forum in Bahardar. And I'm now very honored to serve the forum as a member of its technical committee. But for me, one of the highlights every year of the forum has been this session, the annual Medlis and Ali lecture. I always look forward to hearing the tributes and the subsequent discussions of our Pan-African Giants legacies. Not only because the tributes are moving and inspirational, but because the reflections in many ways also humanize these leaders and in a way took us beyond the headlines and what is often said, opined, written about them. So this lecture series is indeed a platform to help us reflect and pay tribute to key African personalities who have worked for and promoted the ideals of Pan-Africanism for the betterment of their citizens and Africa as a whole. It's about Pan-African leadership linking past, present and future. But the real contribution of this lecture series in my view and what makes it so special and fascinating to listen to each year is the attempt to reveal and reflect on the real person, the full person behind the stories. And, and in so doing, shedding light on the honorees true leadership legacies um, and helping us learn from their examples and their life stories, both the good and the bad. So I hope we can go really, really frank and honest um, in our reflections today. And in many ways for me, these, these reflections are kind of exhortation, uh, inspiring us who remain here to do better, be better, try harder. And I want to believe that by demystifying our icons, it also helps us younger generations to see that leadership potential lies not only in the few chosen and exceptional, but indeed in all of us, especially as leadership is not a, a rank or a position to be attained, but a service to be given. So this year, um, it's been a strange year. I think we can all agree on that. We've been in dire need for inspiration, leadership, radical big ideas for our societies and continent. And because of that, the forum wanted to take the opportunity to pay tribute to two key African personalities who sadly passed this year. His Excellency President Benjamin William Nkapa, the third president of Tanzania, and Professor Tandika Mukandawire, Malawian economist, and intellectual giant. And to help us pay our respects as a Pan-African gathering and reflect on these leaders' legacies, Professor Adebayo Olukoshi will be giving both tributes this afternoon. And of course, many of you at the forum know Professor Adebayo for his illustrious uh, career in international relations, human rights, governance, um, and of course, in his current role as regional director for Africa and West Asia at International Idea. That many of you know, um, but only some of you may know that he also loves dancing, is an avid reader, which is no surprise, um, and described to me um, as an excellent mentor and someone who is deeply invested in nurturing young talents. And that's, I think, um, really much in the spirit also of the Melazenawi lecture to have somebody of, of Adebayo's um, stature to come and share and somebody who believes in mentorship and in leadership. I've been given the kind permission to not only call him Adebayo, but Bayo, uh, as many of your colleagues know him as. And I, and I, and I want that to be a, kind of the, the sign um, that we are at Anaforum. Anaforum is known for its frankness, its informality, its conversational tone, and egalitarian nature. So I hope we can have, keep that spirit even though we are, we're virtual. Um, Bayo is calling in from Lagos and he will share his reflections um, on both honorees as he's intersected with both of them in his professional and intellectual journey. Before I give the floor to Bayo, let me say just a word on the format for the session. Uh, Bayo will begin by giving the tribute to His Excellency President Nkapa for uh, the first 20 minutes and will then break for a 15 minutes Q&A where we'll take some questions from the floor. Feel free to also drop your questions, your reflections in the messaging tab during the lecture as you feel led, stirred, provoked. And we really see the messaging tab also as a space for debate and intellectual exchange. So although you may not make it on the main floor, the, the messaging tab is also a space uh, where we can be engaging. And then we move into part two, where we will delve into Professor Makandawiri's legacy for another 20 minutes. 
And before we go into the second brief q and I'll invite uh, Brian Caboro, um, who is our program director uh, for TANA 2020, and also noted Pan-Africanist, to add his reflections on the honorees, the connection between the two, and the link to this year's TANA Forum theme. So with no further ado, uh, Bayo, you are welcome to share your first tribute. Technical team. Yes, uh, he's trying to connect. Can we give him a minute? Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair. Are you able to hear me? Good afternoon. <laughs> Master of Ceremony, I can hear you. I could hear her now. Yes, and we can hear you too. Uh, we'll just ask you to lift your uh, the face of your gadget a little so that we can see your whole face. Thank you. And then to the side so that you're centered. No, no, the other way. See. The other way. I can't, I can't yeah. even see myself perfect. on this gadget. Perfect, so perfect. Okay. Perfect. A little lower. No, no, no. Yeah, that's good. Great. Oh, oh no, you've gone back. Yeah, thank you. You can go ahead, Prof. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, Hannah. Thank you for the generous introduction. Um, and uh, let me also um, uh, send one greetings from Lagos to all of the participants in this year's uh, TANA Forum. Uh, I hope uh, we'll be able to pull this off with uh, all of the technological uh, challenges that, that we probably have to deal with. Um, I feel very uh, honored um, to be asked uh, to deliver uh, this first uh, of two tributes um, in honor of uh, the late President Benjamin Nkapa. Um, died uh, in July this year, on the 24th of July this year. Um, in a sense, a bit of an unfortunate time uh, to pass on. Probably never a best of times for anybody, uh, particularly uh, somebody who um, was widely beloved as uh, President Nkapa was. Never a best time for anybody to pass on. Uh, but as you rightly said, uh, Chair, uh, these are very strange times. And in the midst of the global pandemic, uh, which uh, the world has been grappling with. Um, the death of uh, President Nkapa, in a certain sense, uh, came to add uh, to a sense of uh, um, pain and, and agony uh, that have been associated with uh, the impact uh, and consequences uh, of the pandemic. Um, uh, in any case, I think it is uh, something to be celebrated, and I would like to congratulate the uh, leaders of the TANA Forum. Uh, something to be uh, grateful that we are able to celebrate him uh, today um, in the context of this uh, gathering. Um, in many respects, it's, it's, it would seem a very unlikely choice for um, a person like me to be asked to pay tribute uh, to President uh, Benjamin Nkapa. Um, and uh, left to my own devices, I probably wouldn't have um, chosen uh, or made the first choice uh, of doing so. 
knowing that there are very many other well-qualified people uh, who could uh, do uh, an even better job than I would ever do uh, of recalling uh, the times uh, and the life of uh, President Nkapa. Um, however, I however decided to take on this challenge, uh, partly also in order to underscore a fact which may not necessarily always resonate uh, with many of us, uh, that pe President Nkapa uh, came as Pan-African, as many of the old Pan-Africanists were. As somebody who began his career at the very start of Tanzania's independence in 1961, working in the office of the late Mwalimu Julius Yerere um, as a press officer, uh, and ranked amongst his closest aides along with um, the late John Wickens, who was private secretary, affectionately known by many Tanzanians as Mama Wickens, uh, ranked alongside her as one of the closest aides uh, to uh, the founding uh, father of the Tanzanian, of modern Tanzania. Uh, out of the press office of the uh, late Walimu, uh, Benjamin Nkapa had amongst other duties the editorship of the party newspaper, the Tanzanian African National Union, uh, which ushered Tanzania to independence. Uh, and in the period since then, uh, served as a, long li a lifelong associate uh, of Walimu Yerere uh, to a point, I think, uh, of being rightly qualified as being one of the Yerereists, uh, one of the most ardent Yerereists uh, of Tanzania and of, uh, uh, of, of the entire post-colonial period in the history of the country. Now, I think it's important uh, for us to um, underscore this early association, which the young Benjamin Nkapa had uh, from his early career with uh, the late Julius Yerere, because in many respects, all through his life, um, much of his political career had been very tight, tight, closely tied with Walimu Julius Yerere. And in my own experience, uh, fast forwarding uh, to the time when I first had the privilege and opportunity to interact with the late Benjamin uh, Nkapa, um, I came to understand not only the full breadth of the weight that Walimu Yerere represented uh, in Tanzania, um, uh, from working with him, uh, but also uh, of the kind of esteem in which he held the late Benjamin Nkapa. And I will elaborate on this uh, uh, in a moment. Um, having served uh, the party as uh, editor of its newspaper, helping to establish the Tanzania News Agency, um, the first uh, news agency of the country, um, in the post-colonial period, uh, Benjamin Nkapa was to devote uh, all of his life, actually, all of his life to public service, serving at various times as Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Science, Technology and Education, Minister of Information and Culture, and subsequently uh, President of the uh, United Republic of Tanzania, uh, from 1995 um, to uh, when he retired uh, in 2005. And after he left office as president, uh, he was to take on various roles as a peace envoy across the continent, uh, but also globally succeeded Walimu Julius Yerere um, some years later as chair of the South Center in Geneva, a position which he relinquished just a few months actually uh, before he passed on uh, to President uh, uh, Thabo Mbeki uh, of South Africa, who is the current chair of the South Center. And it was in the context of the South Center that I first had that privilege of meeting Benjamin Nkapa. Those were very interesting moments across our continent, a period of transition, that which amongst global scholars like uh, Samuel Huntington uh, they described as the period of the third wave of democratization around the world. 
and of which Africa had become a part uh, of the story of democratization. As you would recall, at the end of the 1980s into the beginning of the 1990s, a new wave of pressures, popular pressures, built up across the continent, demanding, amongst others, political and governance reforms that culminated in the opening up of political spaces and also uh, the reintroduction in many countries uh, of multi-party politics. Tanzania was, of course, in the throes uh, of that transition as well. Uh, a transition which uh, I would suggest uh, was to probably mark the third or fourth most important landmark event in post-independence Tanzania. The first in my estimation being the decision to move towards the union uh, between Tanganyika and Zanzibar to create Tanzania. The second followed by, which, um, which in my estimation uh, also uh, accounted for tremendous change in the country was the Arusha Declaration and all of the programs uh, associated with it. Uh, and the third of them, I suggest, is the reintroduction of multi-party politics in 1995. That process was unleashed by Walimu Julius Yerere himself when he instigated a public debate on whether Tanzania should, following the example of neighboring countries like Kenya, respond to uh, the changes taking place on the global scene uh, and introduce multi-party politics. A debate which culminated, as you might expect, uh, given the weight of Walimu Yerere in the reintroduction of multi-party politics to Tanzania, and a battle for succession to the second president of the country, Ali Hassan Omani. Now, President Julius Yerere had been somewhat disappointed, and he had his open letter to Ali Hassan Omani uh, as a record of that disappointment. Um, with the record of his successor, uh, the man who took over from him in 1985, uh, largely because of what he considered to be a complete derailment of some of the ideals on the basis of which independence had been constructed uh, by him and by the ruling party, Chamacha uh, Mapinduzi. Uh, and in the context of the search and quest uh, for a succession, um, at a time when, fortunately, I myself had moved to Geneva to work with Walimu Yerere uh, in the South Center as his advisor on Africa. Uh, Geneva, where he was based as chairman of the center, became a bit of a quote-unquote mecca uh, for Tanzanian politicians. Some of them summoned directly by Walimu Yerere to come to see him in order to discuss the processes of change in the country as multi-party politics uh, loomed, and others inviting themselves to see him in order to present their case uh, for high office. In the event, some of those who hoped that they would take over from Ali Hassan Numwili, and whom Walimu Yerere had told categorically uh, he did not deem necessarily fit for the office of president, decided to leave Chama Chama Pinduzi and to launch their own political parties for which Mwalimu, uh, I drafted a few of the letters, uh, sent them letters wishing them good luck uh, in the political fray. Um, but interestingly, perhaps one of the quietest, and certainly one of those who was not in the front line of any lobbying whatsoever, much to the chagrin of the late Mama Wickens, uh, was a certain Benjamin Nkapa, um, who also came to Geneva at the invitation of Walimu uh, and had a one-on-one -on -one with him, which I understood subsequently was basically an invitation to him to consider running for office, both for the leadership of Chama Chama Pinduzi and therefore to fly the flag of the party in the first multi-party elections that would be held in more than a generation in the country. Um, out of all of that conversation, a number of points uh, seemed to emerge uh, that characterized the kind of person that uh, Benjamin Nkapa both represented for Walimu Yerere, uh, but also for what many saw as the next stage in the political evolution of the country. 
Uh, not surprisingly, Paramount, when I asked the question, uh, why Benjamin Nkapa, he seemed like a shy uh, person who uh, even uh, in terms of campaigning, uh, did not seem to have the kind of flamboyance and flair of the youth leader of Chama Chama Pinduzia at the time, uh, a certain Jakaya Kikwete, uh, who was making waves across Tanzania as uh, a symbol of change and of a generational shift in post-Tanzania, in post-colonial Tanzanian politics, um, as compared to a rather quietish uh, um, uh, Benjamin Nkapa, uh, who um, would only speak uh, when asked to do so uh, in most of the interactions which he had with uh, the late uh, Walimu uh, Yerere. And it transpired, uh, according to Walimu Yerere, that there were a number of things as an avid observer of his own country and as somebody who had worked with all, all without exception, of those who were potential successors to Ali Hassan Nwi, uh, that Benjamin Nkapa had characteristics which none of them could beat in terms of leadership. The first of them, paramount from Walimu Yerere, was the question of overcoming trans uh, corruption in Tanzania. Um, corruption, which uh, had become a matter of grave public concern. Uh, elements of which had also uh, compelled Walimu Yerere uh, in his open letter to Ali Hassan Mwi uh, to challenge the ruling party uh, to make a decisive change uh, with regard uh, to the culture of public service that was rapidly deteriorating in the country. And Benjamin Nkapa fitted the bill in so far as Walimu Yerere was concerned as easily the least corrupt and the least corruptible of all pretenders to the leadership of the country. And I'm serving it exactly as I heard it, directly from Walimu Yerere, and to some extent, I think, justified by the record which uh, uh, Benjamin Nkapa was to uh, register in office for the 10 years when he was president. A second consideration, according to Walimu Yerere, was the supreme importance of preserving the unity of Tanzania. And remember that this comes from the background of the fact that under Walimu Yerere and Chama Chama Tunduzi, um, as it came to be known, uh, Tanzania had developed a reputation as one of the most successful experiments in post-independence national integration across all of Africa. Indeed, I would even argue across all of the world. Um, the sense of national unity, the sense of shared values and of purpose, which was instilled in the people of Tanzania, uh, including through a language policy that was deliberately adopted, made Tanzania um, not just the pride of Africa, but also the envy of many other countries where ethnic conflicts had basically made nonsense of the gains of independence. And yet, as single party rule ended and multi-party politics began, a certain irredentism began also to show its face in Tanzania. Some might remember that there were those who actually took to the streets to campaign for a return to Tanganyika and the separation of Zanzibar and Tanzania uh, and Tanganyika. Um, and, and the argument that very much like the Ujamaa policy, Tanzania was basically Nyerere's fiction, a fiction which had penalized the mainland and over-benefited Zanzibar. In the same way as there were voices from the island who also did not want much to do anymore with the mainland and wanted to reclaim an independent Zanzibar. Trying moments for Tanzania Try moments for nation building, try moments for state building. And Walimu Nyerere concluded, along with some other leaders of the party, that the necessity for a pair of experienced and stable hands would be able to steer the ship of state in order to preserve Tanzanian unity was a non-negotiable requirement for the leadership of the country. And he threw his weight decisively 
behind Benjamin Mkapa. A third consideration, which also played quite heavily in the mind of Walimu Yerere, was the importance of managing the transition to multi-party politics effectively. And Yerere generally tended to look across the border, to look at what was going on in Kenya, to look at what was going on in other parts of the continent, where in some instances, the ushering in of multi-party politics almost amounted to an opening of the Pandora's box that in some instances resulted in the collapse of central governmental authority and an outbreak of civil war. The management of Tanzania's transition to multi-party politics required somebody who not only had a good knowledge of the Tanzanian political system and processes, but also was able to forge the kinds of compromises necessary in order to make that system work. And there again, the lot fell on Benjamin and Kappa. And without any apologies, with those who are not happy with the decision of the um, uh, key leaders of Chama Chama Penduzi to endorse Benjamin and Kappa, with the decision of those to leave the party, and a good number of them did leave to found their own party, which made some waves and even appeared at the point to threaten the hegemony of Chama Chama Penduzi. Uh, Yerere uh, campaigned uh, fairly vigorously, uh, both proximately and at a distance, uh, for Benjamin Nkapa, who eventually won the first multi party presidential elections in 1995 and began a 10 year rule as president of Tanzania. And I would argue, I would argue, I think, with some degree of uh, confidence that Benjamin Nkapa definitely did not leave Tanzania more divided than he met it. Indeed, in many respects, he saw off some of the worst of the irredentist pressures. And by the time he completed his tenure as president, uh, some of the clamor at the time uh, for a separation of Zanzibar uh, from the mainland uh, had subsided fairly considerably, uh, even if uh, later on they were to begin to rear their head uh, again. Uh, on matters of uh, corruption, uh, it would not surprise us that one of the very first acts in office following his election was the decision to set up a Warioba Commission uh, to make recommendations on how to roll back corruption and tackle the problem of impunity. However, in, an, in, a, in, a, in what I consider to be one of the biggest ironies uh, of his life and his presidency, I would like us to recall that in 1985, Walimu Julius Yerere stepped down from office, architect of modern Tanzania, great believer in socialism with a very strong social democratic content, faced with a severe economic crisis, pressured by donors and friends of Tanzania to step down uh, to adopt structural adjustments, refusing to do so because he could not bring himself uh, to implement a reversal of everything he believed in and had tried to pursue uh, during his period in office, um, uh, and instead opted uh, to leave the political scene and allow a successor generation uh, to try their hands. Benjamin Nkapa came into office in 1995, 10 years after his mentor retired from active politics as such, uh, to also inherit a major economic crisis. Um, uh, underscored by a loss of donor confidence in the country and a drying up of foreign investments. As he said it to me, he was caught between the rock and the hard place. He did not have the option of Nyerere to resign. And the only path which he considered open to himself was simply to go along with the implementation of those acceptable elements of the reform proposals of the Bretton Woods institutions in a way that would enable Tanzania to get back into the mainstream of global economic transactions, attracting donor aid, attracting foreign investment, stabilizing the economy, and hoping that any successor regime will then tackle the greater task of transformation. I want to close. And in doing so, I would argue that perhaps in office, as president, faced with those very tough choices, 
with regards to the management of the economy, Benjamin Nkapa was more of what I would describe as an excessive realist than Nyerere, his mentor, who was somewhat perhaps also a bit of an excessive idealist. Without the option of being able to step down after being freshly elected, precisely to tackle some of the economic problems facing the country, he chose a path of compromise, which whilst it stabilized the economy and brought back the donors uh, and, and, and uh, aid givers uh, to the country, did not necessarily enable the kind of structural transformation which he was known to believe in. And it was only after he left office in 2005 that he began once again to become part of the voice across Africa for the case for structural transformation of our continent with regard to trade, with regard to finance, and all aspects of domestic economic reform that will enable citizens across the country, to conquer, across the continent, including Tanzania, to conquer poverty. And you would read opinion pieces, op-eds which he penned as chair of the South Center, denouncing some of the worst excesses of neoliberalism and making the case for an alternative. That was Benjamin Nkapa, true to himself and what he believed in as a social democrat, but who in office, like many of our leaders, was confronted with very hard choices, which in most cases led to compromises that may also have compromised the full effectiveness of the legacy which they had. Yet we are grateful that we had a Benjamin Nkapa amongst us who, whilst in office, was open to criticism, accessible to his people, and never once gave the impression that to disagree with him or to take an opposing side against him was to expose oneself to danger, attack, and even assassination. I guess Tanzanians looking back on his time today might feel a certain sense of nostalgia that a giant left their midst who was also a statesman of Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bio. Brian, can you make this a bit of an echo? Thank you. Um, thank you very much for those insights. Um, to the late president's story and, and, and legacy. Um, especially appreciate that last note about magnanimity and tolerance um, in a leader and, and how critical that is. And I, I want to go to the, to the messaging tab to see if there are any questions uh, or reflections um, that we can re read out. I see here that Boniface is saying a Pan-Africanist star dimmed, its light continues to illuminate Pan-Africanism path. Um, uh, we have another question also from Joel. Um, but before I take Joel's question, I do want to ask a question myself, and I'll take the liberty uh, as the moderator. You, you really highlighted the, the late um, president's kind of entering into the presidency in a period of transition and political economic reform in Tanzania. What can we glean, what can we learn today from his presidency, good and bad, about leadership in transition? Um, we see transition in, in several places in, in, on the continent, and I think there's something to be teased out here in terms of what, what can we learn in terms of leadership in transition. Um, that's question one. Um, question two, a question for reflection from Joel is, in terms of the evolution of the Tanzanian political economy, was the movement from Ujama to the current system with a greater role for the private sector and enforced a response to a changed global environment or a logical choice of a path of development. Um, so was this enforced, a response to a changed global environment or a logical choice of a path of development? Um, I think maybe start with these two questions and maybe we can uh, provoke uh, others to also come in and feel free to drop your, your questions also just in writing and I can read it out. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Chair, um, and uh, thank you for, for your observation. Um, I think in, in, in respect to the management of the transition, um, it was important, uh, having made the decision to move away from the single-party regime 
uh, to a multi-party system to ensure that it could work uh, as genuinely um, multi-party as possible. Um, it was an important risk that was taken, uh, a risk which, uh, as I indicated, Walimu himself uh, um, uh, weighed quite heavily uh, before penning uh, his opinion that uh, Tanzania needed to open a debate. That was in 1991 uh, when he uh, voiced an opinion that Tanzania needed to open a debate on whether it should continue with the one-party system or not. Now, remember that in the context of that period, there were actually many voices within the ruling party which felt that Tanzania could be immune to the, um, to the dynamics of change that was enveloping the continent uh, at the time as part of the so-called global third wave uh, of democratization. Um, there were those who felt that uh, Tanzania was doing just well, um, and, and it surprised them actually that Mwalimu Yerere would make the case uh, for a, an open national conversation, not managed, not manipulated in any way uh, by the ruling party to allow Tanzanians to air their opinion as to whether a multi-party system was what they wanted. And in the end, the verdict was that Tanzania would go multi-party. Uh, and I think first and foremost, um, what I take out of the experience of uh, Benjamin Nkata uh, was his willingness to embrace the dynamics of oppositional politics, not to suppress it, not to snuff it out, but to embrace it uh, as a fact of life and in so doing to challenge the ruling party to earn its right to continue to win elections or to rule the people uh, of Tanzania. And that frequently involved engagements, um, a lot of it uh, sometimes off radar uh, with um, leaders of, of the various political parties, many of whom were well known to him, uh, some of whom uh, had also worked with him uh, at different points in time, uh, including uh, as, as, as advisors. Um, and that spirit of openness to engage and to converse uh, was, I think, important at that point uh, in the history of Tanzania, um, both to uh, give vent to alternative voices that may have felt themselves uh, suppressed by the uh, politics of the single party system, uh, but also um, to allow for a canvassing uh, of alternatives um, uh, both in society, uh, but also particularly with regard to political society. Um, a second element um, is the importance of transitional leaders uh, to understand themselves in terms of a dual role, not just as partisan leaders of a ruling party, but also states people, states people who have a responsibility with regard to the agenda of state building in a democratic context. I think sometimes leaders of transition uh, on our continent have gotten too carried away with partisanship that they sometimes forget the nation and remember only the party uh, to the detriment of peace and stability uh, in their countries. Um, Tanzania was able to enjoy um, a stable transition um, in almost every respect, based on all of the indicators of stability that we can think of, um, without, um, uh, and that wouldn't have been possible without the kind of states uh, personship that uh, Benjamin and Kappa both embodied uh, and represented. Um, accessibility, which I referred to, approachability, which I mentioned, was also an important quality which he had. Um, both with regard to citizens being able to approach him um, and he set up a structured system uh, for harvesting uh, citizen opinion and input, uh, perhaps not surprising for somebody who uh, is a communicator, was a communicator uh, in his early career, but also um, being open uh, to engage uh, with various strands of political society, um, I think also contributed uh, in no small measure uh, to the kind of uh, success that we we saw in the in the in the transitional process. Um, 
And I think there are lessons there are lessons to be learned there in other places. I would I would probably say that uh, the biggest difficulty, and it's it's not unique to Nkapa, um, uh, and not unique to Tanzania, is the tension between managing a process of political change side by side with a process of economic reform. It is an open question. It is an unresolved question. Uh, and um, I would suggest that for Tanzania, as for any other country on our continent, until we are able effectively to reconcile economic processes, economic governance with the ideals of society and politics which we seek, uh, we probably will continue to live with this tension for a long period of time. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Joel Netichenze. Joel Netichenze, um, thank you for your question. Um, uh, <laughs> President Yerere felt compelled in 1985 um, to resign rather than embrace uh, a vision of economic policy and management that was completely diametrically opposed to the world view uh, on the basis of which he built his political career. Tanzania did not go into the present framework of economic uh, policy management uh, voluntarily. It was sanctioned, it was boycotted, it was pressurized. Remember that uh, an official of the IMF or the World Bank who came to read the riot act uh, to Tanzania uh, weeks before ta uh, President Yerere resigned was actually deported from Tanzania that same evening when he made very harsh criticisms uh, of Tanzania's post-independence uh, economic policy in language that was uncouth and uh, laden with uh, an abuse of power uh, mm -hmm. by uh, a, a transnational uh, financial authority, uh, deported from Tanzania that same day, uh, basically also to send a message that um, the people of Tanzania, uh, as, as far as Nyerere was still president, felt they reserved the right, the sovereign right to make their own decisions. Um, but he left. He left office. Um, the country was in very bad uh, economic uh, straits. Um, shortages were rife. Uh, I recall visiting Tanzania at the time. Uh, and it was a shortage of everything. The system was under comprehensive attack uh, from all sides. Um, and there was really very little choice left uh, than for the successors to Walimu Yerere uh, to uh, seek a deal with the IMF and the World Bank in the same way as much of the rest of the continent did. It's a different discussion as to whether the path that was chosen has served Tanzania well. Um, my view uh, is, uh, is definitely a no. Uh, and this applies for much of the rest of the continent, where I think we can argue um, convincingly, uh, and I'll come back to this in the talk uh, with regard to Tandika and, and Kandawiri, we can argue convincingly that what Africa needed uh, to sloganize a bit was not structural adjustment, was structural transformation. Um, Thank you so much, Bayer. was lost, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much Laura, for answering very comprehensively. I want to take one last question uh, from Muthoni um, and for her to take the floor. Um, and maybe you can also combine that uh, reflection um, with Charles' reflection, um, a question about speaking a little bit about leadership in Tanzania in light of current political realities in the country. But I think Muthoni's question also um, hints at, at this. And, um, and Bayo, you'll, you'll give a very brief answer so you can go to part two. Please, Mithoni. Thank you. Uh, and thank you so much, Bayo, for what was a really interesting run through history and what brought him to power and what he contended with. Could you please comment, given that, and in a way it's a continuation from what you were just talking about, on his links to the party and party structures and processes despite the economic pivot um, under President Mkapa and contrast that with the CCM and its leadership today where we're in the interesting position of the opposition now claiming to be the inheritor of Mwalimu's vision. Uh, 
Um, and briefly, Bio, you shall be brief, so we can also move to part two. Please go yeah, ahead. Th th thank you, thank you, Mutoni and uh, Muriti. Um, I tried to be very nuanced, and you are asking me to be very direct. Um, when I said towards the end that Tanzanians looking back on the uh, Nkapa years may well today celebrate the fact that they had a leader who was open and tolerant to opposition views and to civil society criticism. And there was quite a lot of strident criticism. Um, although um, Nkapa uh, felt himself compelled to seek accommodation with the international financial institutions, um, he rejected every attempt um, to change the ideological um, um, or even the doctrinal basis uh, upon which Chama Chama Pinduzi uh, had been founded. A broadly, what I called in my notes, a broadly social democratic ethos, uh, initially forged within the uh, framework of uh, Yerere's own adherence to Fabian socialism, uh, but uh, eventually uh, domesticated in the framework of the Ujama uh, Declaration uh, to address uh, a range of uh, structural problems. Uh, and those issues remained, in a certain sense, central to the kinds of policy which um, uh, um, Nkapa tried to pursue within the limits of what was possible uh, in the framework of an agreement with the Bretton Woods Institution. For example, uh, throughout his 10 years in office, uh, Mutoni, it would interest you to note that up to 70 some estimates say even 80% of rural lands in Tanzania remained under the control of villages. Um, and this was in spite of the massive pressure for land tightening and privatization that the IMF and the World Bank, particularly the World Bank using Hernando de Soto, uh, author of The Other Path, uh, and consultant uh, to the World Bank in Tanzania, attempted to push and to promote. And whilst he um, welcomed the idea of large-scale agriculture uh, and mechanization uh, alongside titling as a possibility for uh, scaling up agricultural uh, productivity uh, and perhaps even winning a niche uh, in the agricultural export market, uh, he never at any point lost sight of the fact, lost sight of the fact that um, the rural population remained a key constituency, uh, both in terms of the ideology of the party and also his own uh, convictions. And I can cite other examples. Um, I think what has happened, what happened uh, post Nkapa uh, was a process which perhaps Nkapa helped to slow down, even to stall, that uh, effectively became completely unleashed in which Chama Chama Pinduzi became unabashedly, unabashedly neoliberal, even in the pronouncement of its leadership, uh, to a point where, as you rightly said, some opposition uh, activists and politicians were to begin to claim that the party's um, argument of being the inheritor uh, of the Nyerere mantle and legacy uh, has faded uh, considerably, uh, and they have now become the voices uh, in support of the kinds of ideals uh, of social democracy which they really represented. Um, I suppose for me, even more worrisome than that is the decline of the culture of political tolerance in Tanzania, a culture which I think um, earned the country considerable respect uh, from amongst all Africans uh, particularly those uh, who lived under one form of dictatorship or the other, and also saw a multi-party system which was effectively neutralized by authoritarian personalities uh, that presided over transitions. Um, Tanzania would need to rediscover the, uh, um, the, the, the culture of conversation, of debate, and of disagreement, of letting a thousand flowers bloom without uh, the fear and C 
seems like we've lost bio. Maybe technical team, can you see if you can get him back? We're all learning these new virtual platforms. Bio, I thank you so much for, for your reflections. We, you cut off briefly, but it was a, a beautiful note that you were ending on. Um, and maybe you can just complete the sentence um, of a thousand, <laughs> of a thousand plants blooming and that will move into part two. Okay, um, I'm sorry, I didn't even realize I was, I was uh, you lost my voice. But basically I was saying that in terms of political culture, um, it's important that Tanzania should re rediscover um, that aspect of political culture which Nkapa uh, tried to nurture and to defend, uh, mm -hmm. of an ability to have public conversation, public disagreement, opposing views, allowing a thousand flowers to bloom without citizens finding themselves living in an atmosphere of fear and of intimidation, even fear for their lives, simply because they have disagreed or taken an opposing stand against the leader of the country or the ruling party. Thank you so much, Bayo. Um, that's a wonderful way to end our part one. Um, and it's inspirational for all of us to think about how we can embrace political tolerance more, um, both in terms of uh, leadership, but also in, in, in citizenship and in, in citizen, citizen engagement in debate. And it's an exhortation for all of us. Um, we're now moving to part two of the Nala Zenawi lecture, and we're moving from political leadership to uh, intellectual leadership and a reflection on that. Um, and we'll be looking at Professor Makanda Weiris' legacy and work. And I know that he was a close collaborator and, and friend of, of Bios. Um, so we really look forward to hearing your reflections um, on his life and on his legacy. Um, I'm mindful of him. Um, we have some 20 minutes. Uh, I know that we we'll probably go on for much, much longer. And after you speak, I will invite Brian um, to speak for about 10 minutes and um, also probably close our session. We will take one question, but it looks like um, because we have so much to say, um, we, we may just take one or two questions at the end. So please, Bayo. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah. On this one, you will have to stop me. Don't, 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 uh, don't hesitate. Don't will do. do. Uh, because not since the passing, of another Pan-Africanist, Tajuddin Abdurrahim, uh, who died in uh, the car crash in uh, Nairobi on his way to Kigali to celebrate Africa Day, uh, has the passing of uh, an activist intellectual uh, in the person of uh, Tandika Mkandawire uh, had such a big impact uh, on me and I believe on many of us who had the privilege uh, of knowing him uh, and in my case, of uh, collaborating with him uh, intellectually uh, and in some respects, even following in his footsteps uh, in uh, an example of a critical and progressive Nyayoism. Um, I first uh, had the opportunity of uh, listening to Tandika Mkandawire um, as, uh, as an undergraduate. I was actually finishing my undergraduate studies um, at a time when the African continent was sliding into its first major post-independence economic crisis, uh, flagged as an external debt crisis, uh, but which very quickly snowballed into a generalized socioeconomic crisis. And there were clamors for understanding what exactly was going on, how it was that the entire continent, whether commodity producing or not, whether oil producing or not, uh, had suddenly found its fortunes uh, going down and uh, economies in turmoil. Um, and nowhere else to look than to the Council for the Development of Social Science Research uh, in Africa, where Tandika and a group of progressive African intellectuals uh, had come together to establish a continental um, academic platform uh, bringing together the humanities and the social sciences to um, project the African voice uh, in developing narratives about our development. 
uh, and the insight and clarity which Tandika brought uh, to the debates uh, on the African crisis uh, as it began to unfold was easily one of the first magnetic sources of attraction uh, for me and for many others in the Nigerian student movement who um, prided ourselves uh, uh, in terms of our radical credentials. I was part of the Zaria school uh, that was famed for its radical intellectualism, uh, comparing itself in many respects to the Dar es Salaam school, uh, which was another center of radical intellectualism uh, on the continent. Um, and uh, listening to um, Tandika uh, without much sloganeering, without being too doctrinaire or rigid uh, in his presentation, unpack the sources of the African conflict in terms of the structure uh, of, uh, of, of African economies at independence uh, was a refreshing and empowering uh, uh, um, uh, breath uh, of, of fresh air. Uh, for many of us. Uh, subsequently, um, fast forward to the 1990s, armed with my own doctoral degree, back to the continent from my studies, uh, looking for scholarly networks uh, with which to associate myself, the African Association of Political Science, the African Sociological Association. Inevitably, we reconnected again uh, with Tandika. And uh, he gave me the singular honor and privilege of becoming the first director of the inaugural session of the Codestria Governance Institute, an institute that had been set up by Codestria to bring together scholars, young scholars from across the continent to reflect on the crisis of governance on the African continent. 1992, governance was not yet the widespread uh, word uh, in widespread usage uh, at that time as, as, it's, as, as, as it is today. Uh, and I think it immediately speaks to the kind of analytic power and foresight which was packed in Tandika and Kandawiri that he was able to initiate a governance institute as the executive secretary of Kodesia in what I consider to be one of his first and lasting innovations and legacies for intellectual development of our continent. And to fully understand the import of that initiative, one needs only to go back to the debates of the 1980s, again on the causes of the African crisis and the solutions that were appropriate for resolving it. The World Bank and the IMF, supported by their own intellectuals, and you remember the popular book on markets in tropical Africa uh, that made the waves and became one of the um, intellectual foundations uh, for the uh, theory of structural adjustment as applied to the continent, um, uh, had argued that the problem with Africa was that it got prices wrong and therefore the solution to the economic crisis of the continent was to get prices right. It became a slogan repeated by every IMF and World Bank official all through the 1980s. And in a very clever way, Tandika working with others actually unpacked the economic theoretical basis of the thesis of getting prices right and suggested in a 1989 publication that far from being the problem of Africa, getting prices right was in fact subordinate to getting governance right. And for the first time, the word governance entered into the vocabulary of discussions about the African crisis. The World Bank didn't pay Tandika for copyright uh, on, on that concept. Uh, and the other scholars like uh, Zongola and Talaja, uh, NS Wamba Diawamba, Mahmoud Mamdani, who became part of the conversation about getting governance rights in Africa. Um, and typical of the World Bank, it simply hijacked the concept and proceeded to empty it of political meaning by attempting to calculate what it called indicators of good governance by which Africa needed to abide. But in fact, what Tandika and Kandawire and others were calling for was a completely different set of concerns that centered around getting politics right. 
um, premised on the argument that if African countries did not find a way of developing political systems that would allow the full expression of citizenship and also enable them to be at peace with themselves. Apologies again for for a bit of a technical difficulty. We'll see if the technical. Oh, here we are. There was a brief interruption um, of just twenty seconds. So just go back one or two reflections. Okay. <laughs> uh, this 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 fed very well into Tandika's um, uh, reflections on what it would take for the continent to be able both to overcome the problems of development in a post-structural adjustment context and simultaneously democratize uh, in the context of the third wave of democratization that was sweeping across the continent. Um, as executive secretary, he convened us to many meetings in which we tried to look at the content and meaning of the popular clamor from Benin Republic all the way to Malawi uh, that was unfolding on the continent uh, against authoritarian single party and military rule and in favor of multi-party politics. And subsequently to begin to look at how elected politicians could also become the bearers of a developmental project for the continent. And it was out of this reflection that he produced his notion of the democratic developmental state in Africa. Again, a concept which was to gain in considerable currency. He published his initial thoughts within the Cordesia flagship journal, Africa Development, and replicated uh, a modified version in the Cambridge Journal of Economics. And everybody began to speak about the imperative of a democratic developmental state in Africa, not only in terms of the innovativeness of the notion uh, but also the audacity that underpinned it. At a time when it was being suggested by many on the right and left that Africa either had to choose democracy or development, Tandika, in fact, took the position that Africa, by the nature of African societies, that culture of discussion, that culture of Indaba, that culture of the Iroko tree, and the open space conversations in the village square to determine and decide what the future would be and the allocation of resources. That Africa was in fact already condemned to democracy. And it was not a question of asking Africa to choose between democracy and development, but to see how democracy could be put at the service of development and development uh, pursued in a manner that will help to consolidate democracy in a benign and reciprocal manner. And out of this conversation, he also had to take on, and I think he did successfully, the idea that where it concerned Africa, a developmental transformation was simply impossible. And that notion of an impossibility of developmental transformation had been sown by the World Bank when it published its uh, flagship report on the East Asian miracle, in which it produced a stylized narrative explaining what the East Asian countries did in order to achieve the kinds of change that they were able to um, register in a generation and how in the context of Africa, it might prove impossible to replicate it. Tandika was to reject that thesis of impossibility. And for those who may be interested in digging deeper into this, I recommend uh, his book co-authored with uh, Chuku Masoludo titled Our Continent, Our Future, The Politics of Structural Adjustment in Africa, in which he laid out the fact that the just like democracy, development is in fact an innate property of every people and mastering both processes is in fact a function of effective and successful governance. And Africa could achieve the kind of transformation 
which it wanted to see if it was able effectively to evolve the governance leadership necessary to marry development and democracy in an effective way. A third element, and I would, I would probably begin to wind down on that, um, of what I consider to be the intellectual legacy of Tandika Mkandawire is the investment which he put into ensuring that African voices are heard and heard in their full authenticity. Now, much of the history behind Codesrael was developed against the backdrop of the fact, true for most of the rest of our lives, right? The backdrop of the fact that in the 1970s, a good 80 to 90% of all knowledge produced about Africa came from so-called Africanists functioning outside of the African continent. <laughs> it's almost like what we consume in terms of uh, imported commodities in our shops. Um, and effectively, it meant that Africans, in the words of Joseph Kizebo, African intellectuals were simply sleeping on the mattresses of other people in order to develop their own scholarship. The Codestria project, which Tandika and others helped to found, was meant to reverse this situation and encourage the production of African intellectual output autonomously propelled by African readings of the challenges facing the continent. And the encouragement which he gave, including abnegation of an extraordinary kind in nurturing promising young African intellectuals from all parts of the continent will probably be one of the biggest investments in progressive human development in the history of our continent. Not much celebrated, not much recognized, but certainly known to those of us who, like me, have developed our scholarship out of a conviction that there are African perspectives to be projected on every subject under the sun, including Africa, rejecting the suggestion that we can only be experts on our villages and nothing much else. And when it came to quoting uh, developments in other parts of the continent, would be relying on American and European scholars uh, who would have written books about those countries. All of those barriers were broken uh, by Tandika Mkandawire, both in his own individual style, but also uh, in the effort that was deployed uh, to nurture a next generation of scholars uh, through the Cordesia networks and associated institutions. And in every sense of it, for those of us who may be by any stretch of imagination considered to be um, voices that cannot be avoided despite our unorthodox views on many things uh, around us, it is precisely because of the confidence that Tandika and Kandawire and others instilled in us. And I mean it in a very literal sense that I would be invited to give a speech at the anniversary conference of the United Nations and the Tandika and Kandawire would be sitting in the front row and will be signaling to me, fire on bio, fire on that kind of very direct encouragement, which came also in his generosity in reviewing draft essays that we wrote, never at any point accusing us of not rising up to a challenge, but finding subtle ways of encouraging us to scale new heights and to transcend existing frontiers in our quest to make a contribution and a difference. The, Worst nightmare of any young scholar, especially one enamored of Tandika Mkandawiri, was to go out to have a drink with him in Dakar, a city full of many nightclubs and with very many interesting uh, sights and sounds after 7 p.m. And we would usually arrive in Dakar, happy to meet the icons of African social sciences and to sit at their feet both to hear the history of the intellectual struggles of our continent, but also 
to bounce our ideas with them and invariably end up at dinner. Tandika was always indefatigable and he would invite us to dinner, usually at some restaurant that would be his most recent discovery and between enjoying the traditional music of which he often had plenty of analysis to explain its connection to social reality and discussing the purposes for which we were in Dakar and between bottles of beer and of wine, you would find yourself sitting with Tandika up to 5 a.m. and still needing to get up at 9 a.m. to make a presentation. You might want to forgive yourself for appearing late for your presentation, but Tandika would already have arrived a full 30 minutes before, ready for the debate to begin. And we often asked him how he managed. And he said it came down to experience. Your training is both in the seminar room, but also on the streets of Dakar. And if you are able effectively to combine an ethnographic knowledge of your context and your environment with the intellectual arguments that you often pick up from the textbooks and from your research, you would in fact be able to tell a unique story about Africa. Ever the optimist, never discouraged about Africa, he was one Pan-Africanist who believed that it is possible in Africa, another development is possible in Africa, and he lived his life in pursuit of that effort. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so very much, Bayo. Um, I'm very moved by uh, by the um, inspired myself listening um, um, to your reflections and and in kind of preparing for this for this lecture series, I, I, I came across uh, what Mamdani said about Akandawir um, as well, where he said he was a complete intellectual and a complete human being. And I think towards the end of your tribute, we really saw that, um, the seminar rooms and the streets and the connection in between. Um, I want to hand over to Brian um, to briefly reflect um, on both these legacies, uh, maybe focusing a bit on the connection and, 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 and the connection to the theme. And then we'll maybe take, if we have time, one question at the end as we close. Uh, Brian, some seven minutes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, let me start with President Mkapa. I only met him in 2005 at the World Economic uh, Forum in Davos. Uh, and we engaged in some interesting discussions and had countless other meetings thereafter. Um, it was four ideas from what uh, Bio has presented that are important about the legacy of President Mkapa. The first was his commitment to the philosophy of equal humanity. Equal humanity in Tanzania and equal humanity globally. And this informed his critique of the global, the developed world and in its relationship with Africa. Uh, and he characterized it this way. He says, what we have they say, we will sh not share, but what the poorer countries have, we will share with them. This is selfish. Yeah, it doesn't make for one world. So it was part of his critique of, critique of globalization. And under that critique, he critiqued trickle-down economics or neoliberalism, the idea that uh, if we did certain managerial things, managed our economies exactly the same way as the West does, structured ourselves the same way as the West, Western economies are, that we would be transformed and, and, and developed. And it's interesting that his critique went to critique of policy, critique of institutions, critique of the inequities in structures such as the WTO, and so on and so forth. And his sense was that there needed to be a global alliance of civil society and intellectuals. Uh, including civil society of the North, campaigning that their own governments change policies that were impoverishing Africa. So President Mkapa had this notion that we have to distinguish between poverty and impoverishment. Impoverishment being the outcome of certain policies that manufacture poverty on an industrial scale, uh, and poverty 
being related to other factors as opposed to just the structural components. And his, so his sense about this global alliance of civil society was it was not enough for civil society from the global north to come to Africa to fix poverty or to reduce it if their own governments were in the WTO, in the United Nations, in the bank, in the international financial institutions, were adopting policies that were causing this poverty. And then, of course, he had to deal, as Bayer has said, with the question of did socialism fail or succeed in Tanzania? And his characterization, and it's related to Joe's question, was this, that if you define socialism as an account, uh, as an economic development policy of public ownership, it reached a stage where growth was unsustainable and unachievable. And then he suggests that, however, socialism as a process in which Tanzania was building a national economy characterized by a sense of both egalitarianism or egalitarian ownership and partnership was extremely successful, right? And he says, and this is the reason why Tanzania is as stable as it, as it is. So if you go to his critique, his critique suggests the following in terms of leadership. And in our thinking about the AFCFTA, his critique suggests that it is not just fixing economies, enabling goods to move, but it is enabling African expertise, African skills to move. His critique was also anchored on the belief that there was a right to development, which he eloquently articulated within the South Center. And that right to development required of the global north the cancellation of debt, especially debt owed by poor countries such as his own. And in his characterization, there was a moral and financial commitment required in order to manage the global developmental crisis. And his sense was that the transformation of Tanzania, the transformation of Africa would be quicker if, not, if we did not just simply reschedule debt, but if we canceled debt. And his sense was it's not correct to characterize the debt crisis in Africa in terms of wastage inefficiency and corruption. We needed to look at the scandalous nature of Brian, you're muted. So his sense was we could exit this, but in order to exit this, we needed the policy space to develop our own domestic entrepreneur to develop our own industry, but to develop on our own terms, not on terms uh, dictated uh, by others. And in this respect, he simply said to the North, put your mouth, put your money where your mouth is. As Bayer has already pointed out, President Mkapa had two contradictions. That those contradictions were captured in another giant, Fidel Castro, who said, I've never seen a revolutionary who's not had to live through the pain of reform. And he was also, like was said by left scholars many years before him, that we do not make history in circumstances of our own choosing. <laughs> we make history in circumstances that are thrust upon us. And at the point of reform, what he was trying to do was to do what was required of him by his country, by his party, and also by the moment. And the judgment is whether he did it well. Let me move to Tandika. And because whilst I said I met President Mkapa uh, within a capitalist forum, I actually met Tandika Mkandawira within the apps forum. And I think that first I was not, I had read him and Guy Mohone and all the other people that um, Bayo was talking about. And then suddenly I meet this giant and all that happened during that dinner was jokes, jokes and jokes. If anything is to be remembered of Tandika Mkandawira is that apart from his fine intellect, his wit, his uh, subtle humor, and in each of the jokes was a lesson. He never did anything out of extravagance. There was always a message being communicated. Bayo has already said that he was committed to giving Africans their authentic voice. But there is something else related to that. that he was obsessed with the role of higher education in Africa. 
and the need to share policies that had been force fed to Africans about disinvesting in higher education. And this reduction of development into pro poor poverty uh, reduction. So Tandika argued that, look, investment in youth, when you say demographic dividend, because we're going to be hearing a lot of it this week, he says, without investing in higher education and tertiary education, or what we're now calling STEM, science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics, as well as the social sciences, makes no sense. You cannot get a dividend out of the air. That was his argument. If you're going to get a dividend out of African young people, African governments need to invest in higher education and invest in tertiary education and in vocational training. That's the one thing that links to, and if we're going to get a dividend for the AFCFTA, we have to link it to the investment that we are making into research and development, into higher education, into tertiary education. The second thing was his dismissal of the notion of capacity development by external actors. And it's captured. He says, in effect, they're telling us that they know what we don't know and that we do not have the capacity to know what they know. Ego, they must build our capacities to know what they know. And hence, Bio's statement about his obsession with ensuring that the knowledge was our own. Nobody can be an expert in our lived realities. And to Tandika, the whole continent was a country. Issa, Issa Shivji once described him in 2013. He says, he's an African first, an African last, and an African always. And in describing, and this will be my last point, because you could talk about um, Tandika for a very long time. In describing Tandika's, so Tandika was very, if you like, brutal in his critique of the last 50 years of independence, but also brutal in his defense of attempts to manufacture amongst African intellectuals and young people a political amnesia that sanitizes the empire and pretends as though apartheid was just a passing moment, that colonialism and slavery was just a passing moment. He reminds us that part of this arises out of authoritarian rule, the lost decade of structural adjustment, uh, some of the failures that we've seen that Bio was discussing about the intolerance in leadership, the capture of agency, the displacement of the culture of debate and dialogue and discourse. But he argues that Africa is the youngest continent. Average age, 20. Average age of African leaders, 62. And he says this is the age of the majority is one third the age of the ruling, the rulers. And he says there is a disconnect, and he points this disconnect, a disconnect between the ruler and a disconnect between the citizens, the majority young people, and the policies that are being passed because they are alienated from those policies. Uh, mm -hmm. And that the liberationist rhetoric does not seem to appeal to these young people, which leads some of them to engage in very dehistoricized political amnesia uh, that refuses, right? It dismisses any notion of negative uh, colonial legacies as merely victimhood. Uh, and downplays the account of a particular generation on this. And that the adverse form of Africa's inclusion into the extremely hierarchical, militarized, and financialized uh, global system is part of the problem. So I would, I would, since I said that is where I would end, yes. his critique of leadership was clearly this, that we had privatized what should have been common uh, heritage, right? And we had experienced nationalist intoxication of leaders as a result of psychophancy, right? That we'd seen the misuse of authority and, and common assets, and that nationalism had become exhausted, right? And the ideological underpinnings of independence had become, as Bayo described Tanzania, totally abashed. So as we remember Tandika, and remember President Mkapa, in the discussion of the AFCFTA, the challenge for those that who gathered this year's TANA Forum 
is not an erudite or eloquent description of figures that are possible if we trade. Is the fundamental question, where shall the ordinary African be placed in the economic system that we are creating? And how will the dividend, the so-called demographic dividend, become a possibility if AFCFTA does not have as a precursor a huge investment into our higher education, our tertiary education, our vocational training? The surest instrument for African development is African people. Our young people are being schooled and no skills are being built. We are giving away African resources and say we are creating opportunities. When we cite African trade figures with the globe, we are citing the trade that foreign companies based in Africa uh, are generating. So my last quote would be, if Coca-Cola were to open a branch in Africa, or even move its headquarters from Atlanta to Africa, would Coca-Cola have become an African company? It would seem to me the CFTA has to answer. What is the dividend for Africa, more so in the context of COVID? That dividend must start with African youth. It must start with African ideas, knowledge, and institutions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian, um, for also adding your insights and to center the theme of the year um, around trade and its linkage to development, security, and Africa's broader role in the world in these highly uncertain times and for centering human beings very critically as well. Um, and this very much appreciated. Um, I'm aware that we are one minute to end of the session. Um, so I would like to thank uh, Bayo uh, very, very much for his riveting reflections. I think we all feel inspired um, and, and, and ready to fire on, um, to continue to, to reflect um, on these legacies and see what we can take for our own lives, for our own, for our own countries and for the continent at large. To all of you who joined us today, thank you so much for signing in, uh, despite the virtual overload that we are all under. Um, and I hope you are also inspired by these legacies uh, that we've honored today and, and stimulated to really continue to improve uh, the continent, both on building on the foundations that were laid by those who have gone before, um, but perhaps also by rebuilding and resetting underpinnings that can serve the citizens of Africa even better. So this session closes the first day of the 2020 Tana Forum, and I wish you all very thought-provoking discussions in the coming days. Uh, thank you very much, Asante Sana, I'm Asad Ginalo, and I'll hand over to Brian, our, our program director. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Another pom-pom for our very able chair, uh, and a pom-pom for Bio for always being the exceptional, uh, eloquent, and on point. Uh, we have resolved in Tana that uh, at next year's election, given the problems in Africa, we are going to elect bio president at large. You can choose any country to rule uh, across <laughs> the continent. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you so much. We will see you shortly. Uh, we will take a short break and then we will return. Thank you so much. Have an awesome, awesome. We have one more session left and I'm hoping you can join us. We have an amazing panel that's, uh, that's, that's, that's going to start us off. We are now getting into the meat of the Tana uh, Forum. Remember, we keep it informal, we keep it real, we keep it pointed. It's not rhetoric, it's about practical solutions to Africa by Africans. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, good afternoon, or oh, good evening, and good morning, um, depending on which part of the world you are in. We have an exciting panel on rebuilding after COVID-19, lessons for effective governance and sustainable peace and development in Africa. I would like to introduce the moderator for this session, His Excellency Abdurrahman Yusuf Ali Ainte, who is a former Minister of Planning and International Cooperation in Somalia. Uh, sir, uh, we are handing over uh, the steering wheel uh, for the session to you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. And good afternoon, um, colleagues. Thank you for all of you who are um, joining here and those of you who are joining virtually. We're all getting used to the um, technical side of, uh, of this uh, uh, virtual event. Uh, it is my uh, distinct honor to uh, be moderating this uh, uh, panel. And uh, I have some of the most distinguished uh, experts uh, in Africa on the subject. Um, as you might have seen, we will be discussing uh, rebuilding after COVID-19, lessons for effective governance and sustainable peace and development in Africa. Um, as you know, uh, the effects of uh, COVID-19 has not only impacted um, the economic side of things in the continent, but it also impacted the political side, the security and governance side of the continent, um, and has created enormous amount of problems um, for policymakers, for government officials, and uh, for the private sector equally. Um, and this panel is supposed to take a stock of exactly what are the concrete lessons we have learned um, from that, and uh, what, uh, especially as it relates to governance and sustainable peace and development in our continent. Um, we only have about an hour, so I'll get right into it without further ado. Um, and I have about uh, five panelists. I understand that many of them are here and some are joining us virtually. So um, uh, let me then introduce uh, our panelists. Um, and I will uh, start. Uh, and, and I'll just say that each panel member has about seven minutes. And I request that you please stick to the time as much as possible. Um, so we have time for Q&A later um, in the hour. Uh, so the first uh, person I would like to call is uh, my good friend, uh, uh, His Excellency Dr. Wokne uh, Gebeyehu, who is the Executive Secretary of IGAT, who I understand is joining us virtually from Djibouti. Uh, the floor is yours, my friend. I, I think you are on mute. Are you hearing me? We can hear you now. Thank you very much, my brother. Thank you. Uh, good evening for all of you, my brothers and sisters from different uh, corners of the world, from Addis Ababa and other places. It is a pleasure and an honor to speak on Dana Forum, which I know very well for a long time. So uh, I am connected to you from Uti, the headquarters of uh, IGAD, a beautiful city uh, of IGAD member states. So, uh, as you have mentioned, uh, the moderator, uh, Your Excellency, uh, the rebuilding after COVID-19 uh, lessons 
for effective governance and sustainable peace and development in Africa, even if we don't know where exactly uh, after uh, this is uh, this after after COVID, we are also we are inside in COVID. So I want to highlight some of uh, the current situation in terms of health, peace, and uh, and uh, uh, other impacts. And I will come to the lessons. The health impact in our region, uh, uh, colleagues, brothers and sisters, as you know, when I'm speaking now uh, in, in, in this region, the infection of COVID is around 1,958. That is around for the past 200 days, the data is going up and it looks like uh, uh, this, this kind of data, the, the next data that uh, uh, gradual increase in the daily rate of infection. I don't want to go to the detail on these issues. In terms of countries, uh, uh, this is the data, how it looks like. Ethiopia, Kenya, Sudan, Uganda, Djibouti, Somalia, and South Sudan. Uh, they have uh, the number is there. But I want to point, make a point on this, uh, on this area. The trend analysis in Igad member states. The case fatality rate of the COVID-19 in, in IGAD region stands at 2%. This is lower than other parts of the world, but IGAD faces the challenge of low rate of testing and detection. So that shows that this data cannot be the most reliable data. Uh, let me go to the economic impact of IGAD in our region. That is the most important thing. This is the data of IMF. Definitely, uh, the region has suffered a lot. The economic imp impact of COVID-19 has been severe around the world, for sure. The pandemic has cut down gross projections from the IGAD region from over 4.5 to below 0.5%, thereby significantly arresting the, prog the progress. That is, this region was one of the fastest growing uh, uh, economy of the world. Let me point out some of the impacts of the COVID-19. Number one, increased unemployment. This region is a youth region, 65, 70% of this region, uh, the population is used. So the number of unemployment is increased. The remittance, which comes from different corners of the world, has reduced. Uh, this is also another impact, the agriculture, tourism, hospitality, this, uh, this the, the, the areas which employ 85% of the workforce has already reduced. Weaken the local currencies, that is important. Goods and services are more expensive. Higher food and community prices, local stimulation, flooding. These are the challenges that we are uh, facing. In terms of peace and security, uh, my colleagues, there are, uh, I can put it in five episodes, influencing peace and development in the Horn of Africa. That is the history one I will leave to you, from scramble for Africa to until COVID, post COVID-19. Uh, there are uh, the Cold War era, war on terror uh, era, uh, and also 2018 to the present one. So the peace and security situation in our region, according to IGAD's analysis is, here is the point. Number one, escalation in conflict and transnational security threats. That is violent extremism. Al-Shabaab stepped up recruitment efforts during the lockdown period. Uncertain electoral calendars in the region. You can take the case, Ethiopia and other member states that still uh, there is a debate on these areas that created an uh, unpredictable atmosphere in the political landscape of the countries. Higher level of displacement and migration from uh, the after effects of COVID. As you know, uh, IGAD hosts over 4 million refugees and 9 million IDBs. Increased conflicts, conflict with host communities higher tensions between countries of the origin, transit and destination, stranded migrations mainly in the Middle East. The other point that I want to mention is the Igad region remains a trade theater of international interest. 
that is the geopolitics of the region, which I don't want to go to in detail. The Red Sea Gateway, the South Sudan oil, Northern corridors, the conflict, the crisis in the Gulf states, the competition of big and the small fishes, these all things are already around here and continue to be here. There is also a dispute between or among member states, that is territorial and maritime boundaries. Uh, these are some of the challenges that we were facing in the region. On the positive note, we can mention in this COVID uh, time, the South Sudan uh, peace process that is significantly is a progress. The Sudan transition government signed a peace agreement. Somalia qualified for debt relief and there is an agreement in Somalia politicians about the election. These are also the positive development that I can mention for this discussion. IGAD has responded on these issues in our strategy that we call it three plus two plus one that I'm not going to discuss in detail on these issues. We are facing three major challenges, that is the health problem, the food security problem and peace and security problem. The two or intervening challenges also, the locust and flood challenges. So we can call this region with the past nine months, the region of triple threats, a challenges, a multiple challenges that we suffered. And because of that, we're expecting migration. So. These are the challenges that we were facing, but we try to respond. Countries has tried to respond. International communities have supported in one way or other. Most importantly, the region and the people from the region, they tried to help themselves and the regional response was also very visible. So we did some of intervention in cross-border areas by support of international community, refugee areas, internally displaced people. Uh, so these are the areas that we were working. We have regional response strategy. It is working and we are working on it. But from the framework of uh, this COVID and after COVID, lessons for effective governance, sustainable peace and development, these are my texts we can discuss on the points. Number one, multilateralism is still working, especially the regional approach that we were doing for the last seven, eight months, both efficient and effective. We were working with African Union, European Union, World Bank and United Nations, especially we intervened in volatile areas that the border posts or the cross borders, the pastoralist areas, the migrants, internally displaced peoples who are the most vulnerable communities. So we work together and we try to combat this crisis. The second point, it is a critical to strengthen regional and national capacities for crisis and disaster response. Here's a point. This region is one of disaster-driven region, according to the African Union study. We have a lot of a combination of cocktails of crisis, but we don't have regional emergency fund, disaster response framework mechanism, and also in terms of disease, we don't have comprehensive disease surveillance system, and also early conflict warning. These are the areas that we have to work to tackle some of the things that will come for the future. Enhance the level of diplomatic engagement between the member states to keep avenue of peace dialogue open. Enhance development cooperation and coordinate crisis and disaster response. This is also definitely because of, we are working on peace building. We are working with peacekeeping this region. So. Diplomacy should be a very important vehicle to tackle some of the conflicts. For example, in South Sudan, the peacekeepers, the dialogues and negotiations among the parties in Sudan, Somalia, in, in other areas, this, the diplomatic engagement will, should be a framework and the one that 
should be strong regionally, should be strengthened, should be strengthened in the region. The debt cancellation is essential to unlock resource for health, social economic and peace and security intervention. This is the Africa, the region should echo the voice of this debt cancellation for our international community since we are suffering one of the problems that this region is facing because it's heavily debt problem that we are uh, witnessing in the member countries. Enhance investment in conflict and early warning to identify and prevent address emerging challenges to peace and security. So these are the major points. What my conclusion is, all challenges have its own opportunities. The First World War has given us the League of Nations, the Second World War as well as finally created the multilateral institution, the United Nations. So this is also a kind of international crisis. So we are hoping to have an opportunity to have, to have a very strong multilateral platform to combat such kind of international crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for those very kind um, remarks. I think you have introduced us to some of the main challenges facing uh, this region, specifically the Horn of Africa, from uh, uh, political humanitarian uh, migration. I think uh, one important takeaway from your uh, intervention, Dr. Um, Wakirano, is, uh, is uh, the delayed electoral um, calendars um, as an impact of COVID-19. That's an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, now, I have the uh, distinct honor to introduce the next speaker, and that is Professor Edwin Maloka, who is the CEO of the African Peer Review Mechanism. Uh, the floor is yours, sir. Uh, thank you very uh, thank much. You very uh, much uh, uh, thank you very much, Your Excellency, my brother, Chairman. Um, I've been asked, uh, of course, to, to co contribute to this discussion, and I thought that uh, I'll look at it uh, from the point of view of the work that we are doing at the APRM the review work with our countries uh, across the continent, for, for currently with 40 members. And I just want to say that the from the governance angle, we we made an observation that the at the country level, <clears throat> in countries responding, uh, countries in their response to 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 the pandemic, that the uh, the the there were four competing approaches uh, from a government perspective. The first one was the what you can call the public health dimension. So across the continent, of course, ministries of health were deployed to. To, to respond to, to the pandemic, we were epidemiologists, ministers of health across. So there was a, you, you could say, this massive uh, public health uh, uh, dimension to, to the governance response by countries. The second one, of, of course, is uh, it's what one can call, which is actually how it's called, the disaster management dimension. So some countries, in addition to treating this uh, crisis as a public health crisis, they also dealt with this as a disaster management. I'm, I'm talking about the country where I reside, which is South Africa, where there was uh, two, two parallel processes working concurrently in how the government responded to this. On the one hand, you had the Minister of Health acting on the basis of the national public health uh, uh, provisions, uh, making some interventions in society and parallel to that, and this one was the least ministry. It was the, the, the disaster management minister responsible for, for disaster management. And under that, of course, in the case of South Africa, there was a debate whether is this a national disaster or a, a state of emergency. And some countries on the continent actually treated this as a state of emergency. And as you say, in the case of South Africa, they treated it as a, as, as a national disaster. But either way, so there was this national disaster state of emergency dimension, which has a lot of, of governance dimensions and implications. The third one was, of course, which was across the board, was the security dimension to, to how governments responded to this, which involved enforcement measures which are necessary to prevent the spread of the virus, 
enforcement measures that are necessary, rational, and in the public interest. And some of that us were put under heavy lockdown by, by countries. Um, and then, of course, uh, 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 it creates to public outcry, but it's necessary. So the security dimension uh, is, is, is also part of it. Then the fourth one is the, what you can call the, 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 the livelihood dimension to it, which is economic consideration. Some governments uh, uh, came, uh, uh, came up with what they call the stimulus packages to try to, and subsidies on some sort of economic packages to support the vulnerable groups, the breadwinners, small business traders, and so on. So the, 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 the livelihood dimension was, was also a, a factor. And then fifthly, you could talk about what I want to call here the social cohesion dimension. Uh, that while you while 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 putting in place all these measures, which are competing, it's different ministries, different government departments, different interest groups, different actors, and so on, competing on who's the dominant element in the response or the national response to this crisis. Of course, there were issues of national or social cohesion also which uh, came to the fore, the issues of uh, which took the form in some countries of uh, mass protest against state uh, enforcement measures, the media outcry, and then of course the issue of public trust. So the countries that uh, do better or did better, or this is still ongoing, do better is where you had a, a, a high level of public trust in government. So people believe that government is active on, on their behalf, that the measures that, that are being undertaken, unpalatable, un, un, unbearable as they are, they are in the public interest. So the issue of social coercion is uh, it's, it's, it's very, very, very important. As the APRM, we conducted a study, uh, we, we called it a preliminary report on Africa's uh, governance response to COVID-19. We launched it at the height of this pandemic, and, uh, and we went on it with the, with the Africa CDC, the African Union Commission, and we had the involvement of APRM member states, where the Continental Task Force collecting data from our, our member states. And the report, of course, we think that it can be used to articulate evidence-based governance response in member states, as well as to facilitate sharing of tested approaches on the governance response to COVID-19. Uh, and then, of course, the, the study looks at, the, the report looks at national level responses, specifically examining each country's response in the four areas, legal and institutional mechanisms, disease prevention and containment measures, social and, and humanitarian measures, and economic, fiscal, and monetary uh, measures. The report shows that 51 states uh, had, by that time, were, were, were doing the report, implemented more than one of these measures, with 70 states having implemented all the four measures that were examined in the report. And the report also, of course, comes up with the recommendations at the three levels, the continental level, uh, 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 recommendation relating to the African Union, then the APRM uh, national level recommendations, and 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 so forth. And and now we are working on the second phase of this report, which is going to be much more detailed. The first one was positioned as a as a as a you could say a preliminary study because we were working on it at the height of the COVID. The data was changing on a daily basis, and so on. So the second uh, 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 major, uh, you could say contribution that we are working on is the APRM. We realize that the APRM methodology, we, we, we always say that it, is, it, it, it has early warning value. There's even an uh, AU assembly decision to that effect. But we realize that notwithstanding that, uh, 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 the APRM tool, even in our own reports, did not anticipate this, uh, this, uh, this pandemic and the nature of the crisis, et cetera, et cetera. So we did not, our tool was not able to prepare our member states adequately for, for this. So we then have undertaken an exercise in what we call building state state resilience. So we are amending our tool to incorporate elements of state resilience into the tool that we use. We're already going to be piloting this tool in Sierra Leone. We're already working with our national structures in Sierra Leone. We'll be uh, deploying a team there quite soon. But in terms of the architecture of state resilience, I'll, I'll be very quick because there's not much time. The first one is that when you look at this architecture of state res resilience, you have to look at the legislative environment. It's important that the state, uh, uh, the national disaster response to national disaster is based on the rule of law. That's very, 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 in order to avoid arbitrary state action in response to emergency. That's very, very, so the, 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 uh, the legislation clarifies the rail, it provides for accountability and transparency and also uh, clarifies and involves the role of other agencies of the state, particularly the judiciary and the legislative sector. So in the South African case, there was a debate on whether 
they should use, as I said, the national uh, disaster legislation or the state of emergency. But really, when we go into this exercise, then we're going to look at what legislative provisions countries have or don't have relating to to response or enabling a country to respond to a, to a disaster of the scale of the of this pandemic. The second one is the competent existence or non-existence of a technically competent permanent body. So within countries, some countries have national disaster agencies, etc. So it's very, very, and whether these are experts and they, do they have early warning uh, capability and also that emergency has, we have to do our best to ensure that emergency is not politicized. It doesn't become a political tool and so on. And this, this capacity should be able to predict and build capacity and of course be able to design the and develop scenarios for the future. And uh, it's very, very important that this technically competent body exists to deal with uh, uh, national disasters. The third thing we'll be looking at is public education, because it's important that the national emergency and response to national emergencies or to national disasters is internalized in society. Kids learn about it in school syllabus and so on. I know like in some countries where there is a uh, or you could say frequent occurrence of floods or they live in the vicinity of volcanoes or active volcanoes, they integrate these issues into the curriculum and school syllabus so that kids and others, they, they, the national drills and so on. So the issue of public education, when you go to countries, we look at the extent to which public education provides or prepares society for, in our case, we are not prepared for this pandemic. It's nowhere in our, in our public education. And then the fiscal revenue. Do we have fiscal revenue measures for bad times? We always say, even when you budget, provide for contingents. Uh, do we have any? The, 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 what we see across the continent is countries who are not ready even fiscally for, for this. And then a rapid deployment force. Some countries have a national, what they call the National Guard, and I don't know how many in South Africa they use the police and the army, and none of them were trained and prepared for, for this kind of... Uh, and then, of course, the issue of regional cooperation is very key, the role of the regional actors. We just had a brilliant presentation from our colleague in IGA, at IGAT. The SADC did some work, AU, and so on and so on. So the regional response, will be looking at it as well when we look at this... Uh, uh, when we, we conduct, you could say, the APRM exercise around uh, building state resilience. So when we look at the extent to which the country uh, responded. And then finally, I think is an issue that we have to look at uh, maybe beyond this, even at the level of the AU, even in the sub-regional mechanisms like SADC, the harmonization of the WTO uh, international health regulations and the Sandai framework which is an international instrument that is used for disaster management. You find that the two are running parallel, but largely at the level of the AU, this was treated as a public health emergency. The Sendai framework mechanism that exists even in the AU was not fully activated. So we need to see how we, 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 we deal this entity. It could be because, Mr. Chairman, I'm finishing, the, the whole idea notion of disaster management in the AU and globally is based on the supposition that the kind of disasters we'll be faced with is floods, is, is fires, and so on. So nobody, even in the, even if there was, it was written in black and white, but in our own thinking and mentality and preparedness, we didn't prepare ourselves for a pandemic of this nature. We're thinking of fire, floods, and, uh, you know, maybe earthquake there, maybe volcano, but not a pandemic. So even the whole Sendai framework is, is pretty... Is, is predicated on that notion of, of disaster. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And this is really to share, to say as the APRM, we have this study going, and then we are also working on this uh, disaster management or preparing or state issues of state resilience to incorporate them into the APRM methodology, and we'll be deploying our team very soon to, to Sierra Leone to test our tool. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Professor Maroka um, of the APRM for giving us what is a very comprehensive picture. legislations to national preparedness and uh, the various other elements that need to be uh, included in the preparedness for a pandemic or for a national disaster um, like this one. So thank you for that. And without further ado, let me introduce the next speaker, uh, Dr. Raji Tajuddin, who is the head of Division of Public Health Institutes and Research for Africa CDC. The floor is yours, sir. You have seven minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Professor, <laughs> uh, my boss, Professor Maloka, CEO of um, APRM, 
distinguished uh, participants and uh, participants who are also joining us um, online. So I will use this moment to share with you what we have done at Africa CDC. Uh, we highlight what has been the impact of this COVID-19. And uh, of course, I will also use the opportunity to share with you what we think should be the next steps as far as uh, responding to this COVID-19 pandemic. So as of today, we have over 1.6 million cases of COVID-19 on the continent, uh, over 38,000 um, deaths. But the good thing is that um, our cases still remain under 5% of the global total. And in terms of death, we are somewhere around 3 to 4%. Furthermore, the other good thing is that uh, over 83% of our cases have actually um, recovered. The continent has actually moved from um, over 120,000 cases per week to slightly over 50,000 per week. However, we are not yet out of the wood. The trajectory may, be, may seem to be going down, but we still have over 8,000 cases per day, which means that we need to continue to do what we are doing that is making us to be at this um, level. Now, let me shift here and share with you what has been the impact as far as the continent is concerned of COVID-19. First and foremost, this COVID-19 has exacerbated the already existing inequality. Take, for instance, the issue of um, school closure. You will discover that uh, for the apps, that's the well-to-do, they have access to the so-called distant learning platform. What about their cousins, their nephew, their relations in the community, in the village, who do not have access to this? So what happened to them? So if care is not taken, some of these children that are out of school will never return back to school. So we need to address this. Two, issue of food security. You know, it's also a major concern as far as this COVID-19 pandemic is concerned. And a lot of studies are out there. For the sake of time, I won't go into the details of the modeling study or the forecasting that's come out if we do not do something to address the issue of COVID-19 pandemic. The third issue is issue of human rights. You will agree with me that the COVID-19 pandemic has further exacerbated the issue of our human rights. For instance, right to education, right to basic health. You know, these are fundamental human rights that one way or the other have been affected by this COVID-19 pandemic. Issue of poverty. Over time, we have moved to try to eradicate poverty in the developing world, especially in Africa. Today, if care is not taken, these gains will be eroded. Take, for instance, more than 70% of our population are actually in the informal sector. Now you go lock down the countries, what happened for those people in the informal sector? These are people that cannot work remotely. You know, the nature of their job, we only, they will only be able to put food on the table if they go out. But now there's lockdown, you cannot go anywhere. So what happened to them? So that means those 70% of people, whether we like it or not, the level of household, I mean, the household, household level of income will be dramatically um, affected. So the list continue like that. For instance, basic health services, childhood immunization, family planning, sexual and reproductive health rights, all these are one way or the other are being um, affected. So distinguished participants, let me share with you what have we done as Africa CDC. I think number one and most important thing is coordination. A week after we recorded the first case on the continent, Africa Union through the Africa CDC was able to bring all the ministers of, uh, together to shed light on what we need to do collectively. The previous speakers have highlighted the need for multilateralism, the need for coordination. And at that ministerial meeting, four key things were emphasized. One, the need for coordination, very, very important. No single country, no single individual can respond to this COVID-19 pandemic alone. We need to act fast and we need to act collectively. Number two, collaboration. Again, emphasizing the need for us to work together. Number three, cooperation, very, very important. Communication, key. We need to know what is happening in our neighbor, you know, so that we'll be able to know how do we work together to bring this COVID-19 pandemic under control. The same ministerial uh, meeting also endorsed a continent-wide strategy, you know, with input from member states. And this continent-wide strategy is being driven by a tax force that was equally approved at that same uh, ministerial uh, meeting. Today, we have been able to move that coordination from ministerial level 
to the level of uh, African Union uh, Bureau of um, Head of State and Government. I think we have to give credit to the leadership of President Cyril Ramaphosa, who has been able to drive this COVID-19 um, pandemic um, response on the continent with, I mean, with all the power you can we can imagine at the at his um, disposal. So, number two, the our strategy underlined the need to one prevent transmission, very, very important. And that's the first thing if you really want to control this pandemic. Two, we need to prevent death. And number three, in our strategy is the need for us to reduce as much as possible the social and economic arm, which underscore or which speak to the relevance of what we are here to discuss um, uh, today. So in order to drive this um, strategy, Africa CDC rolled out a couple of initiatives. Again, I will emphasize on, on just few of them. One is that of partnership to accelerate COVID-19 testing on the continent. Underline that word, partnership. Again, emphasizing the need to work together. And under this partnership to accelerate COVID-19 pandemic on the, on the continent, we are able to accelerate or scale up testing. When this initiative was launched as a whole continent, the rate of testing on the continent was less than 400,000 for the whole continent of 1.3 billion people. Today, I'm glad to inform you that we are over 16 million tests on the continent now, which speaks to the coordination, the collaboration. Number two, the previous speakers have talked on the need to strengthen surveillance. So we also scale up our surveillance through all sort of capacity building exercise, supporting the vulnerable member states with the human resources to drive this and also work with the private sector to be able to leverage technology to drive this surveillance. Then number three is to take care of the less than 20% of our cases that will require one form of medical intervention or the other, ranging from oxygen to our mechanical ventilator and so on and um, so forth. Through this initiative, we are able to put in place a digitalized pool procurement platform called Africa Medical Supply Platform. So with the platform, the issue of whether you are able to pay or not, you know, is not a problem. So this actually ensures that each and every member state actually have access to the needed medical supply. Distinguished participants and colleagues, you will actually agree with me that one of the major and key challenge here at the, with the response to this COVID-19 pandemic is the access to the medical supply. Again, this is where our African Continental Free Trade Agreement need to come in. We believe that with AFCT on board, that issue of access, you know, at least we'll be able to lead it to the BRS and minimum. So with that pool procurement um, platform, most of our member states were able to assess um, in some of the uh, medical supply. Number three on that initiative is human resources. You know, we're able to take our response to the community level. So we support our member state with the deployment of community health workers. You build the capacity of all these um, all these are community health workers. Because for Africa CDC, one of the major um, things we were able to emphasize is the fact that both universal health coverage and global health security are two sides of the same coin. Whether you like it or not, you cannot focus on one and neglect the other. We need to combine um, the two together. So community health workers, today I'm happy to inform you that we have supported more than 32 member states with community health workers. We didn't just stop there. We also supported them with epidemiologists. Now, we know that one of the changing, you know, or one of the things that will be able to bring this COVID-19 pandemic under control is that of COVID-19 vaccine. I mean, vaccine. For most of us who have been following the politics, around the COVID-19 vaccine, you will agree with me that uh, if Africa, 1.3 billion population, 55 member states, we do not stand up, you know, and approach this issue strategically at the highest political level, we'll be left with a tri what trickle down from this COVID, I mean, from the vaccine. In fact, we'll be left at the back of the queue. Go back to HIV, AIDS, and era. Most of the intervention, Africa only have access or add access to this COVID, I mean, to the ART, the antiviral drug, 10 years after most of the developed world have gotten the access to the different interventions. So history must not repeat itself. So in this regard, Africa CDC has put in place a COVID-19 vaccine development and access strategy. And this has been driven at the highest level, again, under the leadership of President Cyril Ramaphosa. You know, we are able to engage at the global level, that's the COVID facility, and we have also put in place our own complementary approach to what we can 
from the COVID facility. We know that for us to uh, come out of this pandemic, 60% of our population will be vaccinated. The information that we are getting from the COVID, uh, from the COVID facility in Geneva is that we'll be giving 220 million doses. Colleagues, what percentage is that? That means they will only give us what we have enough to vaccinate 10% of our population. So we have a gap of 50%. So this is the reason why, one, we need to continue to push that facility to increase our allocation. Two, we need to make sure that on our continent as well, come up with a complementary approach. So the COVID vaccine strategy emphasized three key things. One, the issue of development of this vaccine on the continent. Through one, to be part of the clinical trial, and much more importantly, which also feed into what we are doing here today, the leveraging what is at the disposal of the Africa Continental Free Trade Act Agreement to mobilize our, um, uh, our manufacturing capacity to also be able to produce part of this COVID-19 um, vaccine on the continent. So let me summarize by saying that the major ask for us, you know, to the member states who are listening to this um, particular um, discussion is one, we need to continue to support Africa CDC in a bid to accelerate our testing, surveillance, and treatment. Number two, the whole of society approach, very, very important. Multi-sectoral approach, so everybody needs to be on board. Number three, community engagement. We need to continue to carry our community along. Number four, we should not forget that essential health services, very, very important. We should not only focus on COVID-19. There are other things in Africa, you know, that will really, really, really affect our population. So we need to focus on those essential health services. Child immunization, special reproductive health rights, and so on and so forth. So thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, over. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Tajuddin, for that excellent, uh, I think, summary and also giving us a sense of where we are in terms of the overall um, COVID-19 impact health-wise on the continent and the efforts that we're doing to bring member states together, but also to bring attention um, to the coordination, mobilization, community engagement and so on and so forth. Um, um, ne let me now introduce our next speaker, uh, Reverend Dr. Uh, Fidon Mwambeki, who is the General Secretary of AACC. The floor is yours, sir, and you have seven minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm not representing any government. I don't work in a governmental institution. I'm representing churches. Uh, can you hear me? Therefore, my presentation is a little different. And I'm supposed to speak of what we have learned and how it can help us as we move ahead. And I would like to make very four very quick points of what we, from the public, from the civil society, have seen as lessons which we really need for the future as we develop, and a particular in connection with the Africa Continental Free Trade agreement. Number one, it, we think COVID has exposed that our governments are not quite serious when they agree on things. The integration of Africa is at stake, and they are not serious. What we have seen, the, the hindrances, the barriers, the border, the closing of borders, the, a lot of people stuck on borders of one country to, uh, and another, even in countries with sub-regional agreements like the East African community, to which I belong, I live in Nairobi, and you see all this, whether you are going to Uganda or to Tanzania, Tanzania to Rwanda, Rwanda, Tanzania, uh, everything were thrown out of the window, even though the agreements were clear. So we don't know when these people, uh, the, our leaders, they meet in African Union. We are the uh, AACC, the proponent of uh, Agenda 2063. And some of those commitments which our governments have made in that Agenda 2063, like visa free travel by 2018, we are asking has 2018 arrived or by them not yet? They have agreed on silencing the guns by 2020. Therefore, we are starting to wonder whether their signatures, when they meet and sign, they actually mean much. 
or and therefore should we really expect anything when it comes to the signatures and ratification and what you have, whatever you have on the Africa continental free trade area. So that is our, our first lesson that we beg and we plead with our government when you sign, when you agree, please take it seriously. For us, our governments, when they sign and commit, would like to be able to trust. The second point, we think COVID-19 has revealed our fragility or the fragility of the internal peace and security. There are some, some points which have been mentioned by my colleagues here that countries have used, in some, some countries have used the situation of COVID-19 to actually violate people's human rights in their own countries on the pretense of enforcing and containment and all kinds of things like that. Political dissent has been, of course, are stopped, you can't gather, you can't express yourself because of COVID. And even, uh, even more serious has been the conduct of our uh, security organs in some countries. How can you explain killing people by police because they violated the curfew? They're just late. And some of these had obvious reasons. There is no effective public transport, and where we were wondering have these police who have been trained to quell uh, violence, have, been, have they been waiting to see when they will have a chance to beat people? So that now they have a pretense, they can go out and pee and beat and, 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 and actually even kill, but even sometimes extort money from the people because of the violations. This we have seen and we think this is a, not a good thing for internal security and, and peace as we move on. The third, we have been amazed by African ingenuity, which has been manifested because of COVID-19. Because of this disruptions of supplies, many countries, and I'm happy that you have said it, have actually innovated through appropriate technology, to produce what we need in Africa. I'm living in Kenya, and when I see that in the beginning we had plane loads of masks being shipped and being donated by some rich people in China and other places, but at the end, we see that all these things can be done, can be made, manufactured in Africa. It's not only about the vaccine, which I think I'm happy that the CDC is pushing that, let us manufacture this. But also I have seen, for example, some very, uh, at, uh, I mean, technicians in Kenya who have innovated hospital beds, appropriate hospital beds, appropriate ventilators. The question which we are asking, do countries in Africa really trust? Does the country like Kenya actually give support, appropriate support, to these individual poor people who are trying their best to use appropriate resources which are there, do they get really boosts? Or we are going to put all these barriers to one another, even with the Africa continental free trade area, in order to continue buying and importing from China, from Europe, from US, everything, even the things which our countries can can produce by putting all these barriers of quality of what of what of sourcing. So we are asking that let us use this lesson. And the, the fourth and the last one is that it has been our shock how the uh, the, com the, 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 the the pandemic has revealed corruption in our countries. And debt, many countries have used the, the excuse of COVID to borrow more. But what is happening within countries is that even with this borrowing, actually most of it is used corruptly and other people are going to pay. Our, grandparents, our grandchildren are going to pay. So we are requesting our leaders, please don't use the pandemic and actually, a bigger pandemic is corruption. 
and this appetite to national debt, which they use as a cover, maybe they couldn't borrow before. Now, oh, we need this and this because therefore we are saving lives, but they are squandering this money and as expecting our gener our future generations to pay. We are requesting be responsible and let us fight corruption as even a worse pandemic than, than, than COVID-19 itself. Therefore, the All Africa Conference of Churches has started, has launched a, a policy brief, which we call for a policy brief on debt, on public debt and corruption. These two are linked, and we are very sad that all these greedy people, they don't even care about the sick people. They borrow and take the money, and the people need them, they just don't get it. And this we are really, really sorry. We think our governments are letting us down. Thank you very much. Reverend, for these very powerful uh, words and reminders, uh, I think uh, governments of Africa should heed uh, the call from men of God like you to to make sure that in this time of pandemic that uh, people are not taken advantage of. Um, and now we have one final speaker, uh, and I would like to welcome and call um, Dr. Giles Yabi, the founder of Wathi Citizen Think Tank in Senegal. Um, and I believe you're joining us virtually. So thank you. The floor is yours, sir, and you have about seven minutes. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I hope that you can hear me. Clearly. We can hear you. Okay. Clearly. Okay, thank you very much. And thanks for, uh, for the invitation to the TANA Forum. It's always a pleasure to be here. I would like to greet all the participants, the excellencies, uh, Mr. Chairman, from the, for, for, for this uh, discussion, um, my fellow panelists as, uh, as well. It's a great pleasure to be with you uh, from Dakar. Um, I will speak in French to bring some diversity to this discussion. So maybe I will allow you to take just a few seconds uh, if you need to uh, your headset. Given that I have just seven minutes, yeah, I think it will be easier in, in French so that I can share my, my observations very, very quickly. Um, merci beaucoup. Donc, uh, si... Thank you. Now, if uh, all participants are ready with their headsets in order to get interpretation into English, I wanted to say thank you again. It's always a, a pleasure for me to take part in this at ANA Forum. This would be a third or fourth time. I'm uh, addressing you from Dakar. I wanted to share with you the following main remarks. I believe everybody can hear me now. So what I had to mainly say on this subject, what can we learn from the COVID-19 pandemic uh, from the African continent perspective? Uh, governance, uh, sustainable development angles come into play and uh, there is much to say. And I'll do my level best to say so within the seven minutes that have been allocated to me. Based on what we've learned from our representative from Africa CDC, the leading authority uh, on health issues on the continent, uh, I believe we need to salute the African CDC for the tremendous work that has been carried out since the beginning of this pandemic. I think it is worth noting that it is not every day that we can count on leading African authorities that are perceived as being efficient and serving African citizens. I think everybody had the opportunity to appreciate the leading position that the Africa CDC has taken in its response to the COVID-19 pandemic on the African continent. Two main aspects arise when we're thinking about what we have to learn from this. So first of all, when it comes to specific and useful, clear trajectories, when it comes to preventing illnesses, then the this approach will have been very efficient. Secondly, you know, those people leading this institution also come out you know, because of their refined expertise and this guarantees results. I think citizens today, African citizens today feel 
confident that the adequate experts are leading in this authority that is the main authority working on the uh, issues linked to the pandemic. My second point is to say that I believe many of us are thankful that we have managed to avoid so far the doom that was announced early on when the pandemic first struck uh, worldwide. Although the, the number of cases is alarming in some parts of the continent, namely uh, Southern and Eastern Africa, African resilience goes beyond uh, the, uh, the good measures that have been put in place. All, we also need to thank the right and appropriate strategies that were adopted early on. Um, let's take Senegal. Uh, early on, we thought that the existing health system needed a makeover, and this is before COVID. Uh, and generally, health systems are considered to be very fragile. And this here is one good lesson, meaning the urgency of strengthening the existing health, and health systems and we should, of course, continue to be to remain thankful that these systems were not put to test uh, by alarming COVID cases uh, continent-wide. Thirdly, national resource mobilization. I believe we've seen many countries turn to advisors and experts, the epidemiologists, to seek solutions, namely solutions for the economic crisis that came from the pandemic. This is in a way rare. It's not every day that we see high level political will to turn to a national collective resource mobilizing in search of solutions. Uh, ideally, we shouldn't wait for crises and pandemics to turn towards a collective answer. We should have an ongoing structural approach to seeking such solutions approaching the existing experts within our universities, our think tanks and research centers in order to continually search for adequate solutions. Uh, and coming to what the Reverend said earlier on corruption, obviously when it comes to reform, um, our citizens are always quick to be skeptical uh, and expect government funds to not be put to good use to good use and this is a, a perception that needs to change uh, within the continent fifth point and i believe this is one of the leading lessons from the pandemic this pandemic has made us think over local production whether it being pharmaceutical uh, drugs or equipment, we have now thought again about the importance of local production. This is a great opportunity to recognize that this informal economy, which is the major component of our economy, should also be considered as one being a safeguard of stability and also a great potential to tap in. Six, Point. I would like to, of course, congratulate the work of Africa CDC, but also at regional level, there was a lot of political will and a lot of reactions from the entities. Initially, every country had their own airport rules when it came to testing, for instance, uh, travel rules. Uh, the citizens had to bear the burden from the lack of coordination within a given region. And this is something that is noteworthy. And uh, to keep within my uh, seven minutes, uh, we are wondering collectively what lessons we have for peace and security post-COVID. And before the end of 2020, we started with Guinea. Uh, we are today very worried as to what will happen in Guinea post-elections, Ivory Coast and Burkina regarding the uh, instability and uh, uh, increase of tourism. So before, during and COVID, these are structural problems that do need addressing for the well-being of citizens and this in a very sustainable manner. Uh, we do need to ask ourselves again and again on how to achieve 
good governance. Thank you for your attention, and I hope I didn't take too much of your time. Uh, Dr. Gauss, we really appreciate your intervention and and also reminding us the diversity of language that exists also in, in the continent. Um, so uh, we have now concluded our initial uh, interventions. We actually don't have much time, uh, but I see there are a number of uh, questions and comments that are already streaming through the messaging board. Um, so I'll get right into it. Um, the first question is actually for Dr. Gabayehu and Reverend Mwambeki. And the question is, how can African governments leverage gains from free movement of labor as espoused by the AU and IGAD protocols of free movement while addressing the risks brought about by COVID-19? Maybe, uh, Dr. Gabriel, you can take that question first, because I think it's all very pertinent to what you do at, uh, at IGAD as well. Um, Dr. Gabriel, are you still there with us? Yes, I am. Can you, did you, can you repeat, please, the, the, the question I, for me? I'm sorry, I'm not listening. Sure. So the question is, how can African governments leverage gains from free movement of labor as espoused by the African Union and IGAD protocols of free movement while addressing the risks brought about by COVID-19? Thank you very much. Uh, in fact, <clears throat> this morning we were launching uh, the IOM uh, Continental Strategy on Migration for Africa. And I was uh, stating about uh, the importance of uh, the free movement of people while we are adv advocating about uh, the uh, the free trade, uh, we one, one thing that we have missed is the free movement of people. Yes, indeed, the issue of COVID is there. The most important thing here that I want to stress is the, uh, for me at least, no one knows that uh, uh, where is post-COVID, and the term post-COVID is also misleading. So uh, there, there should be a strategy how to live side in side while we are combating, fighting with COVID, how to enhance our economy. To enhance our economy, uh, the free movement of people as well as trade is uh, two things which, which should be should go side by side. I'm very happy that the free movement of this the trade issues are going very well. Most of the countries have signed this issue, but the free uh, movement of people issues is still a, uh, a challenge for for Africa, so, but the most important thing is dealing with the states, putting a mechanism to how to protect the life and the health of the citizens, side by side, how to promote the free movement of people is the very important thing. You know, we can, we can think of about uh, the PPEs, how to protect our citizens, but we cannot isolate ourselves and we cannot confine ourselves and live the way we are doing so there should be mechanism always so that is what I, what i suggest thank you thank you it's a, an excellent way to reflect on it uh reverend would you like to quickly respond to that yes i we can hear you And cross border uh, violence. But this is, we think, what our governments are supposed to be doing. As a civil society, we don't know how, but we think our governments should address these issues, but not make them an excuse for not abiding by what they commit to do. Um, thank you very briefly. I appreciate that. A question, uh, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Hamaloko, about data protection. You remember the Reverend earlier talked oh, about the um, um, technologies and other COVID-19, and, and someone asked the question, you know, in the absence of a data pr protection uh, legislations for most African countries, how can we make sure that these apps that we're now being forced to download from our member states are not utilized for other reasons, security reasons, and so on? I think 
there is exploitation uh, for that. And I think you, you are the right person to answer that because your job is partially to streamline policies across the continent. <laughs> it's a tough question, I know. I'm not given the right to speak. So oh, uh, I, I think, think someone should give you the... the technical, I think our technical colleagues are probably not happy that <laughs> this question is... And I'm African not technology. But you know, in, in the in the in the spirit, in the spirit of what my colleague from CD was, CDC was talking about, is passionate uh, 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 call for Africa really to be proactive on the issue of uh, of 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 the vaccine. I think the same should go. I'm not really a fan of the so-called fourth industrial revolution because the way it's been put forward, conceptualized articulated and the policy measures that we are being, are being thrown at us, they basically involve integrating us into a, a, a technology platform which is foreign, which is not African. Africans, we don't even have WhatsApp type of, we don't even have Facebook, we don't have, all these things are not African. So the issue that you are talking about is much broader than that, is really how Africa can think about the box, about the folks, the so-called fourth industrial revolution, that it must be based on African technology platform. Not that we'll, de we'll uh, do what Samir Amin talked about, what is it, uh, delinking, no. But uh, we are learning now, we realize now that this technology platform don't come cheap and they are not de geologically uh, innocent, that they can be weaponized, they can be used for other geological leverages. So really, this, uh, that's why I'm talking about what Tajudin was talking about, the issues around uh, uh, us Africans really, uh, looking at self-reliant interventions and the self-reliant part in how we approach the issue of vaccine. We should not be waiting for somebody to come in and bring something here that we ourselves, we have. It doesn't, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's something the Reverend may give us a, a, a verse in the Bible that may help us and lead us in the right path. But it's not something you need to go to the moon for. Right. It's something that we Africans have to start realizing that the path to our future and how we claim the 21st century is not by relying more and more on external people. No matter what the good intentions that they have, but really to look at the endogenous and African solutions to this and try to find, build, put together, bring together our own societies. Let's find the vaccine ourselves. Let's not, these dosages will come, as you say, to just be 10%. But also on the technology platform, I can tell you, there are so many companies here, even in Nigeria, I was listening. People can do the apps, the WhatsApp types, these Facebooks, these technologies are so diffused that we can be able to develop our own technology platform, but we need a continental approach. So even if it goes to the issue of, like now we are talking on this, could you, people are talking, somebody's listening to us. These are not African technology platforms. Even our own cabinets are meeting using these platforms. So really the issue of African technology platform as the basis for the first African uh, industrial revolution, for me, I think is as the path to go. But unfortunately, it's a discussion that we must still uh, uh, engage in as Africans when we're thinking a fourth industrial revolution is the same approach we have towards vaccine. We're waiting for somebody to bring us dosages and come and deliver them here in Addis. We're not thinking about mobilizing the African potential and African capabilities to, to do this thing. We have to do things for ourselves really to claim the 21st century. That's really my, my, my view on this matter. Thank you very much. Very much. Thank you very Thank much, you very much Mr. Chai. Um, and speaking of uh, relying on ourselves, there is a question uh, for probably the first time. Tajuddin, relating to, um, relating to um, you earlier mentioned that there is an effort by your center to try to coordinate efforts to combat COVID-19. So um, what has been the response so far? Um, and especially keeping in mind, someone asked the irregular migration that happens all across the continent, but probably um, uh, mainly within regions. But what, what are the so far uh, coordination efforts that have taken place? All right, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair, for that um, question. And so in terms of optics of what I'm doing in this advocacy, I want to just uh, emphasize the end of the day that we have a massive, massive opportunity for all of us. As I said, it's a coordination that's been doing a lot of that. So what the coordination, I mean, um, we have an approach to the top arm, bottom arm, top arm approach to make sure that uh, before any strategy is rolled out, member states have actually made their input. You know? Number two, we also make sure that uh, there is a clear court community engagement. 
there's a sort of um, an avenue to really carry the community along in everything that we do, including the traditional arm rulers, the religious arm leaders, the different civil society organizations. So that, I mean, uh, much I can say that, yes, the uptake has been quite um, good. In terms of the regional coordination and the issue of, um, uh, you have continental free trade agreement, there is no movement of people. Yes, we cannot have free movement of good without free movement of people. It's just not possible. It's not going to work, you know. So, I and mean, in this regard, I, I think uh, I know part of the efficacy. I mean, Africa, you know, flagship the ten-year uh, flagship um, um, project is to ensure that we have one single passport. So, a lot of discussion is still going on, um, going, going on there. And I believe with time, I think we'll be able to get there. Now, for Africa, see, navigate this particular difficult um, terrain is to encourage as much as possible regional coordination. We call regional integrated surveillance and lab network, you know, whereby we bring different countries within that region together with the rest, you know, to really discuss and agree on harmonized standard, you know, on how do you go about surveillance, how do you go about testing, how do you go about, I mean, um, uh, what do you call it, um, treatment. So, and this has actually um, worked with a lot of, I mean, uh, uh, regions. Because the good thing going for us in Africa is that we have very, very strong regional economic community. You know, and Africa CDC, through its political leadership, have been able to leverage on the different platform and resources at the disposal of the regional economic community. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. That's uh, an excellent response. Uh, I, I see no more questions. So what, I, um, what I would like to do uh, is to give each of our panels this uh, about two minutes of closing statements. Um, you don't have any closing statements. Well, maybe others would do. Um, to sort of uh, wrap up, I think what we've heard is from both civil society, from governments, but also from uh, recs like EGAT. Um, and so, um, uh, Dr. Gabayahu, if you allow me, I'll give you the floor first to give you about two minutes of a closing statement, reflecting on what you've heard so far um, and, and the way forward in terms of how uh, we ensure that there is effective governance and sustainable peace and development um, in Africa it, within um, COVID-19 environment. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, my brother. Yes, uh, the, 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 the most important point is the, just dealing with the COVID uh, and the impact of COVID that we are living in our continent, especially this region, is really facing a triple challenge that, that I have mentioned. Igad is very happy to be uh, to constitute wreck of the African continent in different areas, especially in free trade area. We are now members of the biggest free trade area of the continent. that connects 55 countries and creates collective markets of 1.3 billion people. This is approximately 70% of the global uh, population. As you know, our population in Africa is roughly equivalent to China. Our, our collective economy of 3.4 trillion US dollar is four times smaller than China, four times smaller than Europe and six times smaller than the United States. In terms of our region, IGAD is very ready to join hands to work with the uh, other seven races in terms of regional approach to combat the challenges that we are facing, that is COVID, peace and security, food security, and other natural disasters and man-made uh, challenges, uh, and especially uh, the governance issues, uh, democracy issues, and uh, uh, some of the conflict that we are seeing. Uh, there must remain this, uh, the, 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 the point is it, it should be remain the center of the implementation. All this we have uh, agreed. I think that we intend to, to do this the first and foremost by strengthening cross-border cooperation by connecting communities. We have already formulated a protocol of free movement of persons and other protocol of transhuman or pastoralist communities. So IGAD, we will we recognize the importance of working with our people to strengthen informal cross-border trade and at the same time bringing into the mainstream economy. 
The most important thing, as my uh, colleague from one of the presenters has said, this is the time to coordinate our efforts. The challenges are in different dimensions and in different angles. So this is the time to bring multilateral organizations, regional, as well as member states, bilateral corporations and uh, private sectors to work together to combat the challenge that we are facing. So uh, definitely uh, the human community, the humankind will prevail these challenges as well as and definitely uh, we will we can see and we can uh, visibly can can we predict the world after uh, uh, covid even if we are why we are in now 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 the way how we are working thank you very much uh, my brother thank you very much um, for that very brief intervention uh, Dr. Gail Siapi, your uh, two-minute uh, closing remarks, please. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Uh, je retourne au français juste pour dire uh, quelques quelques mots et uh, pour dire en fait que le, les moments de crise finalement uh, ne, ne sont pas suivis de miracles. C'est-à-dire que les c'est les pays qui sont les mieux préparés, qui sont les mieux préparés, qui sont les mieux organisés. Thank you for allowing me the floor. Ideally, uh, when faced with uh, multiple crises, we already have uh, the necessary tools on hand. Now, in, in our case, uh, regional coordination needs to be strengthened as well as existing mechanisms for African integration will be needed to come into play simultaneously. Now, coming to our context, it seems to me that there are a certain number of components that we need to highlight. To highlight. We need not only to come up with the right strategies, but know how to implement them. And then, uh, as you very well know, African continent is celebrated for its many strategies uh, and however, the implementation always remains lacking. We do need high quality public policy. This is one of the main challenges. The second idea is the political authority of these states. Democracy, uh, democratic space for civil society deserves central position at the negotiating table. And as it was said, there are a certain number of countries today that are very far from this. And numerous countries today uh, are showing us that civil society has a shrinking space as the years go by. This being said, the continent's youth will definitely push us to stop our ancient practice of extra long mandates. And uh, to make my remarks short, thank you so much, and I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Merci close, but uh, thank you for that. Um, and uh, uh, Reverend, would you like, a lot of people actually um, commended you for your powerful intervention on the message board, so if you want to have uh, closing uh, remarks. Thank you. Um, I would like to say Africa, full of people believe in God, of different religions, let us thank God that our impact has not been as bad as it could have been, as many other continents predicted about Africa. We are thankful to God. But secondly, therefore, let us not use COVID-19 as an excuse, not to do what we are supposed to do, but to show us what we are not doing well and actually do better. Let us not use COVID-19 to excuse us from, to excuse our governments actually from doing the things that they are going to do. We as the people would like very much to know when our governments speak, when they are at AU, when they wherever, in the regional economic blocks, when they agree on something, they mean it. But if they put all these doubts in us, 
even the Africa free, uh, continental free trade area, we don't know what to believe and what not to believe. So we really urge, please get committed and get committed to Africa. And the last one is that Africa needs pan-Africanist leaders who are committed to the continent, who are not scared of the challenges, but who are willing to move forward with integration, even in the face of all these problems we see. Problems are there to be solved, and that's why we elect them. Thank you. Thank you uh, for reminding us to, thank you, uh, reminding us to, to thank God. Um, Dr. Tajuddin, very briefly, if you can take a minute or two. All right, uh, thank you, thank you. So, uh, and number one we need to strengthen our health systems number two we need to strengthen our systems for health and the best way to go about it is to have in place what we call a national public health institute number two we need to leverage the opportunity that is provided by africa Continental free trade agreement to make sure that we build our manufacturing capacity Number three, the issue of data governance, very, very important. You cannot do any policy, you cannot do any strategy without data. So we need data that will allow us to come up with a robust and comprehensive uh, policy and uh, strategy. Number four, we need to recognize that health is a security issue. Health is a developmental issue, and we need to treat health as such. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Wonderful. Um, thank you very much. Um, um, and with that, I'm going to hand back to, um, uh, to the organizers. Uh, and thank you all for your time and for listening. In. Yeah. Thank you, moderator. I'm going to make a special request that's not on the program. And I trust that you will understand the spirit within which this is made. I'm going to request the panelists and the delegates in the room to kindly stand. Kindly stand on your feet. Yeah. The, the month of October is a particularly heavy month in the calendar of Pan-Africanism. Uh, today and tomorrow we'll be commemorating the 75th anniversary of the 5th Pan-Africanist Congress held in Manchester at which the decision to undertake the liberation of Africa was made, which uh, reflected an alliance between diasporan Africans and African nationalists. But the month of October is also special in many ways. Whatever we may think of certain leaders, I wish to give you a roll call, a roll of honor of some of the leading Africans that met their demise in October. I will start with President Samora Moises Michel of Mozambique, who perished in an air crash on the 19th of October 1986, brutally made, murdered by the apartheid regime in South Africa. And cross over to Grenada to acknowledge Maurice Bishop, who was executed on the 19th of October 1983 by a machine gun. And then cross to Rwanda, Fred Ruegema, who was the leader of the IRPF, who met his demise in the battlefield on the 2nd of October 1990. Crossed to Egypt, Muhammad Anwar El Sadat, who met his demise on the 6th of October 1981, and Prince Louis Ruagasore of Burundi, who was assassinated whilst having dinner on the 13th of October, 1961, and no other than Mwalimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere of Tanzania, who passed on to glory on the 14th of October, 1999, and cross over to Burkina Faso 
Captain Thomas Sankara, who was assassinated on the 15th of October, 1987, and crossed to Ghana, Ya Asantewa, one of the heroines of African liberation, who died on the 17th of October, 1921. And one of the biggest advocates for what we now will discuss as a reality, which was the Continental Free Trade Agreement or area and Africa's independence, was Muammar Muhammad Abu Anya Khadafi of Libya, who was executed on the 20th of October, 2011. And of course, Henrik Vitboy of Namibia, who also died in this month. Often because of the, what we discussed in earlier sessions, we forget that these imperfect men and women who were committed to the cause of Pan-Africanism, some died at the brutal hands either of opponents, foreign and domestic. I just asked us to stand in order to honor that what we're going to witness this week is progress that they did not see in their lifetime, but progress that they hoped and wished for. And to remind ourselves that the Tana Forum, though informal, what we are discussing about the self-reliance, the governance, is something that's been built on the blood and sweat of men and women, some with outstanding names like this, and others whose names are not known. I thank you for honoring the fallen heroes and heroines. I hope as you reflect this evening, their memory will not be in vain. And as we reflect this week, we will have the seriousness of understanding that whilst Tana is informal and our discussions are collegial, we are about the business of liberating the continent. May God bless you. May you live long. See you tomorrow. And Thank you, Chair. Thank you, everybody. Have a great evening.